Chapter Fifteen, Part Two, of Vandover and the Brute. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Vandover and the Brute by Frank Norris. Chapter Fifteen, Part Two. That same morning, Charlie Geary had eaten a very thick, underdone steak for breakfast after enjoying a fine long sleep of eight hours toward eight o'clock he went downtown he did not take a car he preferred to walk it helped his digestion and it gave him exercise at night he walked home as well that gave him an appetite besides with the ten cents that he saved in this way he bought himself a nice cigar that he smoked in the evening to help digest his supper he was very careful of his health ah you bet one had to look out for one's health at the office that morning he had a nice long talk with beale jr as to hiram wade's suit the great firm of beale and story into whose office geary had been received made a specialty of damaged suits and especially those suits that were brought against a certain great monopoly which it was claimed was ruining the city and the state such a case involving nearly a quarter of a million of dollars was now occupying the attention of the heads of the firm and indeed of the whole office hiram wade's suit was assigned to the assistants beale jr was one of these and charlie geary had managed to push himself into the position of his confidential clerk but beale jr himself took little interest in the wade suit the suit against the great monopoly was coming to a head it was a battle of giants the whole office found itself embroiled and little by little beale jr allowed himself to be drawn into the struggle the management of the wade case was given over to geary's hands when he had first heard of his assignment to the case geary had been unwilling to act against his old chum but it was the first legal affair of any great importance with which he had been connected and he was soon devoured with an inordinate ambition to distinguish himself in the eyes of the firm to get a lift to take a long step forward toward the end of his desires which was to become one of the firm itself he knew he could make a brilliant success of the case geary was at this time nearly twenty-eight keen energetic immensely clever and the case against vandover was strong no one knew better than he himself how intimate vandover had been with ida wade vandover had told him much of the details of their acquaintance besides this a letter which ida had written to vandover the day before her suicide had been found torn in three pieces thrust between the leaves of one of the books that she used to study at the normal school it directly implicated vandover it was evidence that could not be gainsaid geary had resolved to push the case against his old chum vandover ought to see that with geary it was a matter of business he geary was only an instrument of the law if geary did not take the case some other lawyer would at any rate whether van would see it in this light or not geary was determined to take the case it was too good an opportunity to let slip he was going to make his way in the law or he would know the reason why every man for himself that was what he said it might be damned selfish but it was human nature if he had to sacrifice van so much the worse it was evident that his old college chum was going to the dogs anyway but come whatever would he geary was going to be a success ah you bet he would make his way and he would make his money ever since he had come into his little patrimony geary had been making offers to vandover for his block in the mission geary would offer only eight thousand dollars but brunt steadily advised vandover against listening to such a figure assuring him that the property was valued at twelve thousand six hundred vandover had often wondered at geary's persistence on the matter and had often asked him what he could possibly want of the block but geary was very vague in his replies generally telling vandover that there was money in the investment if one could and would give the proper attention to pushing it he told vandover that he vandover was no business man which was the lamentable truth and would much prefer to live upon the interest of his bonds 
rather than to be continually annoyed by defective plumbing complaints and repairs the truth of the matter was that geary knew that a certain immense boot and shoe concern was after the same piece of property the houses themselves were nothing to the boot and shoe people they wanted the land in order to build their manufactory upon it a siding of a railroad ran down the alley just back of the property a fact that hurt the lot for residence purposes but that was indispensable for the boot and shoe people geary knew that the heads of the manufactory were determined to buy the lot and he was sure that if properly handled by clever brokers they could be induced to offer at least one-third more than its appraised valuation it was a chance for a fine speculation and it was torture to geary to think that vandover or in fact any one besides himself was going to profit by it the afternoon of the day upon which hiram wade had brought suit for twenty five thousand dollars while geary was pottering about his swivel office chair with an oil can trying to find out where it creaked a brilliant idea had suddenly occurred to him a stroke of genius a veritable inspiration why could he not make the wade suit a machine with which to force vandover into the sale of the property his first idea had been to push the case so vigorously that vandover would surely lose it but on second thoughts this course did not seem to promise any satisfactory results geary knew very well that though hiram wade had sued for twenty five thousand dollars he could not recover more than five thousand if as much as that geary did not know the exact state of vandover's affairs but he did not think that his chum would sell any property in order to make the payment of damages it was much more likely that he would raise the five thousand or whatever it might be by placing a second mortgage on some of his property this however was presuming that wade would get judgment for about five thousand dollars but suppose that vandover thought that wade could actually recover twenty five thousand suppose that geary himself should see vandover and induce him to believe such a story and to settle the affair out of court vandover was as ignorant of law as he was of business geary might frighten him into a sale yet this plan seemed very impracticable in the first place it would be unprofessional for geary to have an interview with vandover under such circumstances the story was almost too monstrous even for vandover's credibility and besides geary would not pay could not pay twenty five thousand for the property this last was a serious tangle in order to get vandover to sell geary would have to represent the damage suit as involving a larger sum of money than geary was willing to give for the block even a far larger sum than that which the boot and shoe manufacturers could be induced to pay for it it seemed to be a deadlock geary began to see that the whole idea was out of the question yet the desire of it came back upon him again and again he dwelt upon it constantly smelling out the chance for a deal somewhere in the tangle with the instinct of the keen man of business at last he seemed to have straightened it out the idea of a compromise came into his mind what if vandover and hiram wade could be made to compromise upon eight thousand dollars geary would be willing to pay vandover eight thousand for the block that was his original offer wade though he had sued for twenty five thousand could easily be made to see that eight thousand was as much as he could reasonably expect and geary knew the boot and shoe manufacturers would pay fifteen thousand for the lot perhaps more but in order to carry out the delicate and complicated affair it was absolutely necessary to keep vandover from seeing a lawyer geary knew that any lawyer would fight the proposition of a compromise at eight thousand dollars five thousand was as much as wade could possibly get in court and if judgment for such amount was rendered vandover's counsel would advise him to raise the sum by mortgaging some property instead of selling the block yet as soon as geary arrived at a solution of the problem as soon as the deal began to seem feasible he commenced to hesitate it was not so much that the affair was crooked that his role in it was to say the least unprofessional as it was the fact that vandover was his old college chum and that to put the matter into plain words 
Geary was swindling his best friend out of a piece of property valued at twelve thousand six hundred dollars and Preventing him from reselling the same piece at a very advanced figure Again and again he wished that it was some other than Vandover He told himself that in such case he would put the screw on without the least compunction all through one night Geary was on the rack torn between his friendship for his chum and his devouring inordinate ambition to make his way and to make his pile in the end vandover was sacrificed the opportunity was too good geary could not resist the chance for a deal ah you bet just think of it after all not only would vandover believe that geary was doing him a great service but the office would be delighted with him for winning his first case they would get a heavy fee from wade and he would nearly double his money invested in the block in the mission as soon as he had made up his mind to put the deal through he had seen vandover at his rooms early in the morning and had induced him to promise not to engage any other counsel and in general keep very quiet about the whole business the day after he and beale jr had an appointment with hiram wade but toward noon beale jr disappeared leaving word for geary that he had gone to court with his father to hear the closing arguments in this great suit against the monopoly the last struggle in the tremendous legal battle that had embroiled the whole office geary was to use his own judgment in the wade case geary labored with hiram wade all that afternoon the old fellow mistrusted him on account of his youth and his inexperience was unwilling to arrive at any definite conclusion without the sanction of geary's older associate and for a long time would listen to nothing less than ten thousand dollars crying out that his gray hairs had been dishonored and striking his palm upon his forehead nothing could move him he also had his ambitions it was his dream to own the carpet cleaning establishment in which he now had but a three-fourths interest summer was coming the time of year when people were going into the country leaving their carpets to be cleaned in their absence if he could obtain complete ownership of this business within the month he fancied that he saw an opportunity to make more money than he had done before in any previous season why i tell you mr geary he exclaimed indignantly wagging his head it would seem like selling my daughter's honor if we should compromise at any less figure i am a father i i have my feelings haven't i well now it isn't like that at all mr wade answered geary making awkward gestures with both his hands it isn't what we ought to get out of him could any sum of money could millions compensate you for miss ida's death i guess not it's what we can get if this thing comes into court we won't get but five thousand out of him i'll tell you that right now he could raise that by a mortgage easy but if we compromise we can squeeze him for eight thousand you see the fact that we can act directly with him instead of through counsel makes it easier for us of course as i tell you it isn't just the legal thing to do but i'm willing to do it for you because i think you've been wronged and outraged wade struck his hand to his head i tell you he's brought dishonor upon my gray hairs he exclaimed exactly of course i understand how you feel replied geary but now about this eight thousand i tell you what i'll do he had resolved to stake everything upon one last hazard see here mr wade there's a difference of course between eight thousand dollars and ten thousand but the use of money is worth something isn't it and money down cold hard cash is worth something isn't it well now suppose you got that eight thousand dollars money down within three days hiram wade still demurred a little longer for the sake of his own self-respect and his dishonored hairs but in the end it was agreed that if the money was paid over to him in full before the end of the following week he would be content and would agree to the compromise eight thousand dollars would still be enough to buy out his partner's interest and even then he would have a little left over with which to improve a certain steaming apparatus if the amount was paid in full within a week he could get control of the cleaning works in time to catch all of the summer trade geary had calculated that this last argument would have its weight 
the great difficulty now was to get vandover to sell at such a low figure and upon such short notice he almost despaired of his success in this quarter however it all depended upon vandover now early in the forenoon of the next day geary pounded on the door of vandover's sitting-room pushing it open without waiting for an answer vandover was lying in his shirt-sleeves on the corduroy divan under the huge rug of sombre colours that hung against the wall and he did not get up as geary came in in fact he hardly stirred hello cried geary closing the door with his heel didn't expect to find you up so early i've been up since half past six had breakfast at seven fine cutlet and then got down to the office at twenty minutes of eight how's that for rustling eh yes said vandover dully but say exclaimed geary what's all the matter with you you look all frazzled out all pale around the wattles ah you've been hitting up a pace again you're a bird van there's no use talking all night racket this trip i suppose so answered vandover never moving but you do look gone in this morning sure continued geary seating himself on the edge of the table and pushing back his hat never saw you looking so bad you ought to be more careful van there'll be a smash some time ah you better man ought to look out for his health i walk downtown every morning and three times a week i take a cold shower as soon as i get up ah i tell you that braces a fellow up you ought to try it it's better than a dozen cocktails you keep on getting thin like you have for the last few days and i'll have to be calling you skinny seldom fed again like we used to now tell the truth what time did you get to bed last night did you go to bed at all no replied vandover with a long breath looking vaguely at the pipe rack on the opposite wall i thought as much answered geary well that's like you he paused a moment and then went on nervously gesturing with both his hands simultaneously well I've had a long talk with Wade. I tell you, Van, that old boy is as stubborn as a mule. You see, he knows he's got a case. I couldn't talk him out of that. I'll tell you how it is, continued Geary, preparing to spring another mine. He's found a letter Ida wrote you the day before she killed herself. He paused to watch the effect upon Vandover. Vandover waited for him to go on, but seeing that he did not, and that he expected him to say something, nodded his head once and answered, I see don't you know that letter that she wrote to you telling you how it was how she was fixed repeated geary puzzled and irritated at vandover's indifference i know well he's got it anyhow pursued geary and of course that tells against you well i had a long talk with him yesterday afternoon and i got him to compromise of course you know in suits like this one a party sues for a great deal more than he expects to get at first you know he said twenty five thousand that figure was decided upon at the first interview he had with us of course he could never get judgment for that much but he hung out at ten thousand said it would be selling his daughter if he took any less now i knew you couldn't raise that much on any property you have especially in these hard times geary paused for the fraction of an instant he had thrown out the last remark as a feeler to see what vandover would say but his chum said nothing staring vaguely at the opposite wall merely making a faint sign to show that he understood closing his eyes and bending his head and so continued the other i jewed him down and what do you suppose well sir from twenty five thousand i brought him right down to say eight thousand i could see that he had some scheme that he wants to go into right away and that he wants ready money right on the nail you know to carry it through and you bet i was clever enough to see that i waltzed him right over when i began to speak of ready money cash down as soon as he'd squeal i'd spring cold cash on him money down and he's hit gravel like an ostrich well he went on deliberately after a pause getting up from the table and standing before vandover his hands in his pockets well i think that's the best i can do for you van it's a good deal better than i expected but i've done the best i could do for you and i would advise you to see him on the proposition all right said vandover go ahead geary was perplexed 
Well, you think that's a good thing, don't you? You think I've done my best for you? You see it as I do, don't you? Vandover withdrew his eyes from the other wall, glancing under the heavy eyelids at Geary, and with a slight movement of his head and shoulders replied, Of course. Have you got the money? asked Geary eagerly. Then, irritated at his indiscretion, hastened to interrupt himself. You see, he hasn't put his proposition into writing yet, but it's like this. If you can pay him $8,000 in cash before the end of next week, he'll sign a document to the effect that he is satisfied. I've got no money, said Vandover quietly. I was afraid you wouldn't have, said Geary, but you can raise it somewhere. You had better close with the old man as soon as you can, Van, while he's in the mood for it. You'll make a clear two thousand by it. You can see that as well as I can. Now, where can you? How is your property fixed? Let's see. Here's the statement you made to me the other day, continued Geary, drawing his shorthand notes from his portfolio. How about this piece on California Street, the one that you have rented? The homestead, you know. Yes, there's that answered vandover changing the position of his head upon his clasped hands but that's pretty well papered up already returned geary consulting his notes you couldn't very well raise another mortgage on that i'd forgotten answered vandover there's a block on the mission he can have that geary began to tremble with excitement it looked as though he might be able to make the deal after all but the next instant he grew suspicious Vandover's indifference puzzled him. Might he not have some game of his own? The idea of playing off his cleverest against that of an opponent strung his nerves in an instant. The notion of an impending struggle was almost an inspiration, and his innate desire of getting the better of a competitor, even though it was his closest friend, aroused his wits and sharpened his faculties like a stimulant. He had no hesitancy in sacrificing his chum. It was business now. Friendship ceased to be a factor in the affair. Ah, Van was going to be foxy. He'd show him that he could be foxy, too. He can have it? echoed Geary. You don't mean to sign it over to him bodily. Oh, I suppose it could be mortgaged, answered Vandover. Yes, that's the idea, returned Geary. You want me to figure that out for you? I can just as well as not. Well, now, let's see. He went on settling himself at the desk and figuring upon a sheet of Vandover's stamped letter paper The banks will never give you more than two-thirds of the appraised value. That's as much as we can expect That will come to well, let's see that will come to six thousand on that piece Then you could mortgage something else to make up the difference Wouldn't it be more than six thousand asked Vandover with a little show of interest I think that block has been appraised at something over twelve thousand. Ah, yes, returned Geary, putting his chin in the air. That was your agent's valuation five years ago. But you know property out there, in fact, property all over the city, what they call inside property, has been going right down for the last ten years. That's what I've always been telling you. You couldn't possibly get more than nine thousand for that block today. You see the railroad there hurts it. I suppose so replied Vandover. I've heard the governor say as much in his time Of course exclaimed Geary delighted at this unexpected turn Well, then he can have my bonds said Vandover. I've got 8900 in bonds. He can have those let him have anything he wants Oh Don't touch your bonds answered Geary hang on to those bonds are always good u.s. Bonds you don't want to sell those van you see the homestead is already mortgaged and besides you know too that the banks are asking an awful big percent for mortgages on real estate it's seven and a half nowadays don't sell your bonds i'll tell you why u.s bonds are always good they never depreciate but it's different with realty especially in this city just now it's been depreciating ever since your father's time and it's going to go right on depreciating if you want to sell anything sell your realty before it gets any lower Now you don't want to sell your home. Do you you don't like that idea? You've lived there so long and then what would you do with the furniture besides the rent of that 
he glanced again at his notes, is bringing you in a good hundred and twenty-five a month. If you've got to sell at all, why not sell your mission block? All right, said Vandover, as if wearied by Geary's clamour. I'll sign it over to him. No, that's not the idea at all, Geary insisted. He wants the ready money. He don't want depreciated real estate. You'll have to find a purchaser in the next week, if you possibly can in such a short time, and make over the money to Wade. But if you can't sell in that time, you'll have to dig up ten thousand instead of eight. It's a hard position for you, Van. It's just a chance, you know, but I thought I would give you the benefit of that chance. If you want to give me a power of attorney, I'd try and sell it for you. I guess Brunt would do that, replied Vandover. Yes, retorted Geary, watchful as a lynx. But they would charge you a big commission. Of course, I wouldn't think of asking you anything more than the actual costs. I am afraid that they would try to sell it at auction, too, if they knew you had to realize it in so short a time. And it would go for a mere song, then. You know how it is. I thought, inquired Vandover, that you wanted the property. Yes, replied Geary, hesitating. I... I did want to buy it of you once. Well, for that matter, I do now. But you know how it is with me. I might as well sell it to you as to anyone else, returned Vandover. Well, now, it's like this, Van, said Geary. I know that block is worth nine thousand dollars. I won't deceive you. But I can only give you eight thousand for it. That's all the money I've got. I'm not going to take advantage of your position to jew you down. I want the block, I'll admit that, but I'm not going to have you sacrifice it for me, or for anyone else. I think you can get nine thousand for it. I know you could if we had a little more time, and I'm not sure why, but what I could find a purchaser for you within the next week, that would give you nine thousand. Oh, I don't care, Charlie. I'm sick of everything. Eight thousand, nine thousand, anything you like. Take it at your own figure. Geary began to tremble once more, and this time his excitement was so great that he hardly dared to trust himself to speak. His breath grew straught. His hands in his pockets twitched nervously and curled themselves into fists. His heart seemed to him to beat high in his throat. He hesitated long, pretending to deliberate as he steadied himself. Vandover remained silent, his hands still clasped the back of his head, staring at the opposite wall with eyes that saw nothing. The little clock began to strike ten. "'I don't know, Van,' said Geary. "'I don't like to do this, and yet I would like to help you out of this muss. "'You see, if I should ever benefit by the property, "'you would feel as though I had taken advantage of you at this time "'and worked a flim-flam on you.' Oh, I'll look out for that, returned Vandover. No, no, I don't feel quite right about it, answered Geary, wagging his head and shutting his eyes. Better see what we can do at a forced sale. Why, don't you see you will be doing me a favour, said Vandover wearily. I ask you to buy the block. I don't care what your figure is. Once more, Geary hesitated, for the last time going over the whole deal in his mind from beginning to end testing it looking for weak points it was almost perfect suppose the boot and shoe people did not buy the lot he could resell it elsewhere even below its appraised value and yet make money by the transaction the lot was cheap at ten thousand it might bring twelve even as an ordinary legitimate speculation it was to be desired at such a figure suppose the boot and shoe people backed out entirely Suppose even he could not find another purchaser of the property. Why, then, he could hold on to it. The income from the rents was fully ten percent of the price he would have paid for it. Well, Van, he said at last, making a slow, awkward gesture with his left hand, all the fingers extended. Well, I'll take you up, but I don't feel as though I should. He suddenly interrupted himself with a burst of sincerity, exclaiming, Sure, old man. If I had nine thousand, I'd give it to you for the block. That's straight goods. He felt that he was conscientious in saying this. It was true he would have given nine thousand if he had had it. For that matter, he might have given ten or twelve. 
can we settle the whole matter today said vandover right here now i'm sick of it sick of everything let's get it done with geary nearly bounded from his seat he had been wondering how he might accomplish this very thing all right he said briskly no reason in waiting he had seen to it that he should be prepared to close the sale the moment that vandover was willing long ago when he had first had the idea of buying the block he had spent a day in the offices of the county recorder the tax collector and the assessor assuring himself of the validity of the title and only two days ago he had gone over the matter again in order to be sure that no encumbrances had been added to the block in the meanwhile he found nothing the title was clear isn't this rather rushing the thing through he asked maybe you might regret it afterward don't you want to take two or three days to think it over no sure now persisted geary but i've got to sell before three days answered vandover otherwise he'll want ten thousand that's a fact admitted the other well he went on if your mind's made up why we can go right ahead as i say there's no reason for waiting better take up wade while he's in the mood for it you see he hasn't signed any proposition as yet and he might go back on us vandover drew a long breath and got up slowly heavily from the couch saying what's the odds to me what i sell for i don't get the money well what do you say if we go right down to the notary's office and put this thing right through geary suggested come on then have you got your abstract here the abstract of the block vandover nodded better bring it along then said geary the office of the notary adjoined those of the firm of beale and story in fact he was in a sense an attache of the great firm and transacted a great deal of legal business for them vandover and geary fell upon him in an idle moment a man had come to regulate the water filter which took the place of an ice cooler in a corner of one of the anterooms and while he was engaged at his work the notary stood at his back abusing him and exclaiming at the ineffectiveness of the contrivance the notary was a middle-aged man with a swollen purple face he had a toothpick behind each ear and wore an office coat of gray linen ripped at the shoulders then the transfer was made it was all settled in less than half an hour unceremoniously almost hastily for the sake of form geary signed a check for eight thousand dollars which vandover in his turn made over to hiram wade the notary filled out a deed of grant bargain and sale pasting on his certificate of acknowledgment as soon as vandover and geary had signed geary took the abstract thrusting it into his breast pocket as far as vandover was concerned the sale was complete but he had neither his property nor its equivalent in money well declared geary at length i guess that's all there is to be done i'll get a release from old man wade and send it to you tomorrow or next day now let's go down to the imperial and have a drink on it they went out but the notary returned to the anteroom turning the spigot of the filter to right and left frowning at it suspiciously refusing to be satisfied end of chapter 15 part 2chapter 16 part 1 of vandover and the brute this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by adam wybray vandover and the brute by frank norris chapter 16 part 1 that particular room in the lick house was well toward the rear of the building on one of the upper floors and from its window one looked out upon a vast reach of roofs that rose little by little to meet the abrupt rise of telegraph hill it was a sordid and grimy wilderness topped with a grey maze of wires and pierced with thousands of chimney stacks 
Many of the roofs were covered with tin, long since blackened by rust and soot. Here and there could be seen clothes hung out to dry. Occasionally, upon the flanking walls of some of the larger buildings, was displayed an enormous painted sign, a violent contrast of intense black and staring white amidst the sooty brown and grey, advertising some tobacco, some newspaper, or some department store. Not far in the distance, two tall smokestacks of blackened tin rose high in the air, above the roof of a steam laundry. One very large, like a stack of a canada, the other slender, graceful, with a funnel-shaped top. All day and all night these stacks were smoking. From the first to the larger one rolled a heavy black smoke, very gloomy, waving with a slow and continued movement like the plume of some sullen warrior. But the other one, the tall and slender pipe, threw off a series of little white puffs, three at a time, that rose buoyant and joyous into the air like so many white doves, vanishing at last, melting away in the higher sunshine, only to be followed by another flight. They came three at a time, the pipe tossing them out for a sharp, gay sound like a note of laughter interrupted by a cough. But the interior of the room presented the usual dreary aspect of the hotel bedroom, cheerless, lamentable. The walls were whitewashed and bare of pictures or ornaments, and the floor was covered with a dull red carpet. The furniture was a set, all the pieces having a family resemblance. On entering, one saw the bed standing against the right-hand wall, a huge double bed with the name of the hotel in the corners of its spread and pillowcases. In the exact middle of the room, underneath the gas fixture, was the centre table, and upon it a pitcher of ice water. The blank white monotony on one side of the room was jarred upon by the grate and mantelpiece, iron, painted black, while on the mantelpiece itself stood a little porcelain match safe with ribbed sides in the form of a truncated cone. Precisely opposite the chimney was the bureau, flanked on one side by the door of the closet, and on the other, in the corner of the room, by the stationary washstand with its new cake of soap and its three clean, glossy towels. On the wall to the left of the door was the electric bell and the directions for using it, and tacked upon the door itself a card as to the hours for meals, the rules of the hotel, and the extract of the code defining the liabilities of innkeepers, all printed in bright red. Everything was clean, defiantly, aggressively clean, and there was a clean smell of new soap in the air. But the room was bare of any personality. Of the hundreds who had lived there, perhaps suffered and died there, not a trace, not a suggestion remained. Their different characters had not left the least impress upon its air or appearance. Only a few hairpins were scattered on the bottom of one of the bureau drawers, and two forgotten medicine bottles still remained upon the top shelf of the closet. This had been the appearance of Bandover's new home when he had first come to it, after leaving his suite of rooms in the huge apartment house on Sutter Street. He had lived here now for something over a year. It had all commenced with the seizure of his furniture by the proprietors of the apartment house. Almost before he knew it, he owed for six months room and board. When the extras were added to this bill, it swelled to nearly a thousand dollars. At first he would not believe it. It was not possible that so large a bill could accumulate without his knowledge. He declared there was a mistake, tossing back the bill to the clerk who had presented it, and shaking his head incredulously. This other became angry, offered to show the books of the house. The manager was called in and attempted to prove the clerk's statement by figures, dates and extracts from the entries. Vandover was confused by their noise and grew angry in his turn, vociferating that he did not propose to be cheated. The others retorted in a rage. The interview ended in a scene. But in the end they gained their point. They were right, and, at length, Vandover was brought around to see that he was in the wrong. But he had no ready money, and while he hesitated, unwilling to part with any of his books, or to put an additional mortgage upon the homestead, the hotel, after two warnings, suddenly seized upon his furniture. What a misery! In a moment of time it was all taken from him, all the lovely bric-a-brac, all the heavy pieces, all the little articles of virtue, which he had brought with such intense delight, 
and amongst which she had lived with such happiness, such contentment, such never-failing pleasure. Everything went. The Renaissance portraits, the pipe-rack, the chair in which the old gentleman had died, the Arisian bas-reliefs, and, worst of all, the stove, the famous tiled stove, the delightful cheery iron stove with the beautiful flamboyant ornaments. For the first few months after the seizure, Vandover was furious with rage and disappointment, persuaded that he could not live anywhere but in just such a room. It was as if he had been uprooted and cast away upon some barren, uncongenial soil. His new room in the hotel filled him with horror, and for a long time he used it only as a place where he could sleep and wash. For a long time, even his pliable character refused to fit itself to such surroundings, refused to be content between four enormous white walls, a stuccoed ceiling, and a dark red carpet. He passed most of his time elsewhere, reading the papers at the mechanic's library in the morning, and in the afternoon sitting about the hotel office and parlours until it was time to take his usual little four o'clock stroll on Kearney and Market Streets. He had long since become a familiar figure on this promenade. Even the women and girls of Flossie's type had ceased to be interested in this tall, thin young man with the tired, heavy eyes and blue-white face. One day, however, a curious instant did for a moment invest Vandover with a sudden dramatic interest. It was just after he had moved down to the Lick House, about a month after he had sold the block in the mission. Vandover was standing at Lotter's Fountain, and the corner of Kearney and Market Streets, interested in watching a policeman and two boys re-harnessing a horse after its tumble. All at once he fell over flat into the street, jostling one of the flower vendors and nearly upsetting him. He struck the ground with a sodden shock, his arms doubled under him, his hat rolling away into the mud. Bewildered, he picked himself up. Very few had seen him fall, but a little crowd gathered for all that. One asked if the man was drunk, and Vandover, terrified lest the policeman should call the patrol wagon, hurried off to a basement barber shop nearby, where he brushed his clothes, still bewildered, confused, wondering how it had happened. The fearful, nervous crisis which Vandover had undergone had passed off slowly. Little by little, bit by bit, he had got himself in hand again. However, the queer numbness in his head remained and as soon as he concentrated his attention on any certain line of thought, as soon as he had read for any length of time, especially if late at night, the numbness increased. Somewhere back of his eyes, a strange blurring mist would seem to rise. He'd find it impossible to keep his mind fixed upon any subject. The words of a printed page would little by little lose their meaning. At first, this had been a source of infinite terror to him, he fancied it to be the symptoms of some approaching mental collapse. But as the weeks went by and nothing unusual occurred, he became used to it and refused to let it worry him. If it made his head feel queer to read, the remedy was easy enough. He simply would not read. And though he had been a great reader and at one time had been used to spend many delightful afternoons lost in the pages of a novel, he now gave it all up with an easy indifference. But, besides all this, the attack had left him with nerves all unstrung. Even his little afternoon walk on Kearney and Market Streets exhausted him. Any trifling and sudden noise, the closing of a door, the striking of a clock, would cause him to start from his place with a gasp and a quick catch at the heart. Toward evening, this little spasm of nerves would sometimes come upon him, even when there was nothing to cause it and now he could no longer drop off to sleep without first undergoing a whole series of these recoils and starts that would sometimes bring him violently up to a sitting posture, his breath coming short and quick, his heart galloping, startled at he knew not what. At first he had intended to see a doctor, but he had put off carrying his intention into effect until he had grown accustomed to the whole matter. Otherwise he was well enough, his appetite was good, and when he finally did get to sleep, he would not wake up for a good eight hours. One evening, however, 
about three months after the first crisis, and just as Vandover was becoming well accustomed to the condition of body and mind in which it had left him, the second attack came on. It was fearful, much worse than on the first occasion, and this time there was no room for doubt. Vandover knew that for the moment he was actually insane. Ellis had been with Vandover most of that afternoon. The two had been playing cards in Vandover's room until nearly six o'clock. All the afternoon they had been drinking whiskey while they played, and by supper time neither of them had any appetite. Ellis refused to go down, declaring that if he should eat now it would make him sick. Vandover went down alone, but once in the dining room he found that he could not eat either. However, he knew that it was not the whiskey. For two days his appetite had been failing him. The smell of food revolted him, and he left the supper table, going up to his bare and lamentable room, with the feeling that he was about to undergo a long spell of sickness. In the deserted hall, between the elevator and the door of his room, the second crisis came upon him all at once. It was so sudden that it was as if some enemy had leaped upon his back, springing out of the shadow, gripping him from behind, holding him close. Once more, the hysteria shook him like a dry leaf. The little nervous starts came so fast that they ran together, mingling to form one long thrill of terror, the blind, unreasoning terror of something unknown. The numbness weighed down upon his brain until consciousness dwindled to a mere point and mercifully dulled the torture of his crippling nerves. It seemed to him that his hands and head were rapidly swelling to enormous size. All this he had felt before. It was his old enemy, but now with this second attack began a new and even stranger sensation. In his distorted wits, he fancied that he was in some manner changing, that he was becoming another man. Worse than that, it seemed to him that he was no longer human, that he was sinking, all in a moment, to the level of some dreadful beast. Later on in that same evening, Ellis met young Height, coming out of one of the theatres, and told him a story that Height did not believe. Ellis was very pale, and he seemed to young Height to be trying to keep down some tremendous excitement. If he was drunk, said Ellis, it was the strangest drunk I ever saw. He came back into the room on all fours, not on his hands and knees, you understand, but running along the floor upon the palms of his hands and his toes, and he pushed the door of the room open with his hand, nuzzling at the crack like any dog. Oh, it was horrible. I don't know what's the matter with Van. You should have seen him. His head was hanging way down and swinging from side to side as he came along. It shook all his hair over his eyes. He kept rattling his teeth together, and every now and then he would say, way down in his throat, so it sounded like growls, Wolf! 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 I got hold of him and pulled him up to his feet. It was just as though he was asleep. And when I shook him, he came to all at once and began to laugh. What's the matter, Van? says I. What are you crawling on the floor that way for? I'm jammed if I know, says he, rubbing his eyes. I guess I must have been out of my head. Too much whiskey. Then he says, Put me to bed, will you, Bandy? I feel all gone in. Well, I put him to bed. I went out to get some bromide of potassium. He said that made him sleep and kept his nerves steady. Coming back, I met a bellboy just outside of Van's door and told him to ask the hotel doctor to come up. You see, I had not opened the door of the room yet, and while I was talking to the bellboy, I could hear the sound of something four-footed going back and forth inside the room. When I got inside, there was Van, perfectly naked, going back and forth along the wall, swinging his head very low, grumbling to himself. But he came to again as soon as I shook him, and seemed dreadfully ashamed, and went to bed all right. He got to sleep finally, and I left the doctor with him, to come out and get something for my own nerves. What did the doctor say was the matter? asked young Hyde, in horror. Lycanthropy thesis. I never heard the name before. Some kind of nervous disease. I guess Van had been hitting up a pretty rapid gait. And then I suppose he's had a good deal to worry him, too.
Once more the attack passed off, leaving Vandover exhausted, his nerves all jangling, his health impaired. Every day he seemed to grow thinner. Great brown hollows grew under his eyes, and the skin of his forehead looked blue and tightly drawn. By degrees a deep gloom overcame him permanently. Nothing could interest him, nothing seemed worth while. Not only were his nerves out of tune, but they were jaded, deadened, slack. They were like harp strings that had been played upon so long and so violently that now they could no longer vibrate unless swept with a very whirlwind. As he had foreseen, Vandover had returned again to vice. To the vice that was knitted into him now, fibre for fibre. To the ways of the brute that by degrees was taking entire possession of him. But he no longer found pleasure even in vice. Once it had been his amusement, now it was his occupation. It was the only thing that seemed to ease the horrible nervousness that of late had begun to prey upon him constantly. But though nothing could amuse him, on the other hand, nothing could worry him. In the end, the very riot of his nerves ceased even to annoy him. He had arrived at a state of absolute indifference. He had so often rearranged his pliable nature to suit his changing environment, that at last he found that he could be content in almost any circumstances. He had no pleasures, no cares, no ambitions, no regrets, no hopes. It was mere passive existence, an inert, plant-like vegetation, the moment's pause before the final decay, the last inevitable rot. One day, after he had been living nearly a year at the Lick House, Adams and Brunt, the real estate agents, sent him word that they had an offer for his property on California Street. It was the homestead. The English gentleman, the president of the fruit syndicate who had rented the house of Vandover, was now willing to buy it. His business was by this time on a firm and paying basis, and he had decided to make his home in San Francisco. He offered $25,000 for the house, including the furniture. Brunt had several talks with Vandover, and easily induced him to sell. "'You can figure it out for yourself, Mr. Vandover,' he said, as he pointed out his own calculations to him. "'Property has been going down in the city for the last ten years, and it will continue to do so until we can get a competing railroad through. Better sell when you can, and twenty-five thousand is a fair price. Of course, you'll have to pay off the mortgage. You won't get but about fifteen thousand out of it.' But at the same time, you won't have to pay the interest on that mortgage to the banks. That will be so much saved a month. Add to that what you could get for your 15,000 at, say, 6%, and you would have a monthly income nearly equal to the present rent of the house, and much more certain, too. Suppose your tenant should go out. Then where would you be? All right, all right, answered Vandover, nodding his head vaguely. Go ahead. I don't care. He parted from his old home with as much indifference as he had parted from his block in the mission. Vandover signed the deed that made him homeless, and at about the same time the first payment was made. Ten thousand dollars was deposited in one of the banks to his credit, and a cheque sent to him for the amount. The very next day Vandover drew it against for five hundred dollars. At one time, he had had an ambition to buy back his furniture from the huge apartment house in which he had formerly lived, and with it to make his cheerless bedroom in the Lick House seem more like a home. He felt it almost as a dishonour to have strangers using this furniture, sitting in the great leather chair in which the old gentleman had died, staring stupidly at his Renaissance portraits and copies of Assyrian bas-reliefs. Above all, it was torture to think that other hands than his own would tend the famous tiled and flamboyant stove, a stove that had its moods, its caprices, like any living person, a stove that had to be coaxed and humoured, a stove that he alone could understand. He had told himself that if ever again he should have money enough, he would bring back this furniture to him. At first, its absence had been a matter for the keenest regret and grief, 
he had been so used to pleasant surroundings that he languished in his new quarters as in a prison. His indulgent, luxurious character continually hungered after subdued, harmonious colours, pictures, ornaments, and soft rugs. His imagination was forever covering the white walls with rough stone-blue paper and placing screens, divans, and window seats in different parts of the cold, bare room. One morning, he had even gone so far as to pin about the walls little placards which he had painted with a twisted roll of the hotel letter paper dipped into the inkstand. Pipe rack here, Mona Lisa here, stove here, window seat here. He had left them up there ever since, in spite of the chambermaid's protests and Ellis's clumsy satire. Now, however, he had plenty of money. He would have his furniture back within the week. He came back from the bank, the money in his pocket, and went up to the room directly, with some vague intention of writing to the proprietors of the apartment house at once. But as he shut the door behind him, leaning his back against it and looking about, he suddenly realised that his old-time desire was past. He had become so used to these surroundings that it now no longer made any difference to him whether or not they were cheerless, lamentable, barren. It was like all his other little ambitions. He had lost the taste for them. Nothing made much difference after all. His money had come too late. Why should he spend his five hundred dollars on something that could no longer amuse him? It would be much wiser to spend it all in having a good time somewhere. Champagne dinners with Flossie or betting on the races. He did not know exactly what. It was true that even these alternatives would not amuse him very much who would fall back upon them as things of habit. For that matter, everything was an ennui, and Vandover began to long for some new pleasure, some violent, untried excitement. Since the sale of the block in the mission, he had seen but little of Geary, young Haight, had not been his companion since the time when Turner Ravis had broken with him. But little by little, he had begun to associate with Ellis and his friend the dummy, Almost every evening the three were together, sometimes at the theatre, sometimes in the back rooms of the Imperial, sometimes even in the parlours of certain houses, amid the murmur of heavy silks and the rustle of stiffly starched skirts. At times they would be drunk, four nights of the week, and on these occasions it was tactically understood between Ellis and Vandover that they should try to get the dummy so full that he could talk. However, Ellis's vice was gambling, he and the dummy often passed the whole night over their cards, and as Vandover came more and more under Ellis's influence, succumbing to it as weakly as he had succumbed to the influence of Charlie Geary, he began to join these parties. They played Van John at five dollars a corner. Vandover won as often as he lost, but the habit of cards grew upon him steadily. Toward eleven o'clock, the evening of the day upon which he had drawn his five hundred, Vandover went around to the Imperial, looking for his two friends. He found Ellis drinking whiskey all alone in one of the little rooms, as was his custom. Fifteen minutes later, the dummy and Flossie joined them. Flossie had grown stouter since Vandover had first known her, nearly ten years ago. She had a double chin, and puffy, discoloured pockets had come under her eyes. Now her hair was dyed. Her cheeks and lips rouged, and her former air of health and good spirits gone. She never laughed. She had smoked so many cigarettes that now her voice hardly rose above a whisper. At one time she had been accustomed to boast that she never drank, and it had been one of her peculiarities for which she was well known. But on this occasion she joined Ellis in his whisky. She had long since departed from her old-time rule of temperance, and nowadays drank nothing else but whisky. She had even become well known for the quantity of whisky she could drink. For half an hour, the four sat around the little table, talking about the new enormous Sutro baths that were building at that time. After a while, Flossie left them, and the dummy began to imitate the motions of someone dealing cards, looking at the same time inquiringly into their faces. "'How about that, Bandy?' asked Vandover. "'Shall we have a game tonight?' The man, a few words, merely nodded his head and drank off the rest of his whiskey at a swallow. They all went up to Vandover's room. Vandover got out the cards, the celluloid chips, and a fresh box of cigars. 
The dummy held up two fingers of his left hand, shutting them together afterward with his right, and making a hissing noise between his teeth. He raised his eyebrows at Vandover. Vandover understood, and, ringing for a bellboy, ordered up three bottles of soda in siphon bottles. The game was Van et Un, or, as they called it, Van John. They cut for banker. Ellis turned the first ace, and Vandover bought the bank from him. For the first hour they were very jolly, laughing and talking back and forth at each other, the dummy especially communicative, continually scribbling upon his writing pad, holding it toward the others. But it was not necessary for them to put their replies in writing. He understood from watching the movement of their lips. The luck had not declared itself as yet. None of them had lost or won very much. The bellboy brought up the siphons. The dummy took off his coat, and the other two followed his example. They were all smoking, and an acrid blue haze filled the room, making a golden blur about each gas globe. But little by little the passion of the gambling seized upon them. The luck had begun to declare itself, alternating between Ellis and the dummy. Vandover lost steadily. Twice already his bank had been broken, and he had been forced to buy in. The play resolved itself into two parts. Vandover struggling to keep up with the game on one side, and on the other a great battle going on between Ellis and the dummy. Long since they had ceased to laugh, and not a word was spoken. Each one was absorbed in the game, intently watching the cards as they were turned. The four gas jets of the chandelier flared steadily, filling the room with a crude raw light that was reflected with a blinding glare from the four staring white walls. The room grew hot, the layer of foul, warm air just beneath the ceiling slowly descending. The acrid tobacco smoke no longer rose, but hung in low, slow-waving threads just above their heads. They played on steadily. A great stillness grew in the room, a stillness broken only by the little rattle of chips and subdued rustle of the shuffled cards. Once Vandover stopped, just time enough to throw off his vest, his collar and his scarf. For a moment the luck seemed about to settle on him. He was still banking, and twice in succession he drew Van John, both times winning heavily from the dummy, and a little later tried Ellis at twenty, when the latter had staked on nearly a third of his chips. But in the next half-dozen hands Ellis got back the lead again, winning from both the others. From this time on it was settled. The luck suddenly declared openly for Ellis, the dummy and Vandover merely fighting for second place. Ellis held his lead. At one o'clock he was nearly fifty dollars ahead of the game. The profound silence of the room seemed to widen about them. After midnight, the noises in the hotel, the ringing of distant call bells, the rattle of dishes from the kitchens, the clang of closing elevator doors, gradually ceased. Only at long intervals one heard the hurried step of a bellboy in the hall outside and the clink of the ice in the water pitcher that he was carrying. Outside, a great quiet seemed, in a sense, to rise from the sleeping city. The noises in the streets died away. The last electric car went down Kearney Street, getting under way with a long, minor wail. Occasionally, a belated coupé, a nighthawk, rattled over the cobbles, while close by, from over the roofs, the tall, slender stack upon the steam laundry puffed incessantly, three puffs at a time, like some kind of halting clock. The room became more and more close. None of them would take the time to open the window. From ceiling to floor the air was fouled by their breathing, by the tobacco smoke, and by the four flaring gas jets. By this time a sombre excitement burnt in their eyes and quivered in their fingers. Never for an instant did their glances leave the cards. Ellis was drinking whiskey again, mixed with soda, his hand continually groping for the glass with a mechanical gesture. The dummy was so excited he could not keep his cigar alight, and contented himself with chewing the end with a hysterical motion of his jaws. The perspiration stood in beads on the back of Vandover's hands, running down in tiny rivulets between his fingers. His teeth were shut close together, and he was breathing short through his nose. A fine trembling had seized upon his hands, so that the chips in his palm rattled like castanets. In the stale and murky atmosphere 
of the overheated room, in the midst of the vast silence of the sleeping city, they played on steadily. Then they began to plunge, agreeing to play a no-limit game and raising the value of a red chip to ten dollars. At times they even played with the coins themselves when their chips were exhausted. Vandover had lost all his ready money, and now for a long time had been gambling with the five hundred dollars he had that day drawn from the bank. Ellis had practically put the dummy out of the play, and now the game was between him and Vandover. Ellis was banking, and at length offered to sell the bank to either one of them. For the first time since the real gambling began, they commenced to talk a little, but in short, brief sentences, answering by monosyllables and by signs. How much for the bank? inquired Ellis, holding up the deck and looking from one to the other. Instantly the dummy wrote ten dollars in figures on his pad and showed it to him. Vandover looked at what the dummy had written and said, Fifteen. Twenty, scribbled the dummy, as he watched Vandover's lips form the word. Twenty-five, returned Vandover. The dummy hesitated a moment and then wrote thirty. Ellis shook his head, saying, I'll keep the bank myself at that. Forty dollars, cried Vandover. The dummy shook his head, leaning back in his chair. Ellis shoved the pack across the table to Vandover, and Vandover gave him a twenty-dollar bill and two red chips. On Vandover's very first deal around, the dummy stood on the second card for twelve chips. Ellis bet twenty-five in his first card, and, as he got the second, turned both of them face up. He had two jacks. Twenty-five on each of these, he said. I'll draw to each one. Vandover looked at his own card. It was a ten spot. At once he grew reckless, and seized with a sudden folly, resolved to attempt a great coup. Double up, he ordered. The dummy set out twelve more chips, and Ellis another fifty, making his bet an even hundred. Vandover began to deal to Ellis. On the first jack, Ellis drew eighteen and stood at that. The first card that fell to the second jack was an ace. Van John, he remarked quietly. The dummy drew three cards and stood on nineteen. Vandover turned up his own card and began to deal for himself. He already had a ten. Now he drew a seven-spot and king in succession. The bank pays, he exclaimed. He paid the dummy twenty-four chips. He gave Ellis fifty for the eighteen he had drawn in his first jack, and one hundred for the Van John upon the second. Since the latter combination called for double the amount wagered, besides this, the bank was lost to him. Including the forty that he had paid for the bank, he had lost in all two hundred and fourteen dollars. Never in his life had Vandover played so high a game. Never before had he won or lost more than fifty dollars at a sitting. But he was content to have it thus. Here at last was the new pleasure for which he had longed, the fresh violent excitement that alone could arouse his jaded nerves, the one thing that could amuse him. However, the failure of his coup had left him without chips. He was out of the game. He decided that he would stop. More than half of his five hundred dollars was gone already. He drank off a glass of soda, the dregs of one of the siphon bottles, and got up yawning, shivering a little, and stretching his arms high above. The other two played on steadily. The dummy began to gain slowly upon Ellis, playing very cautiously, betting only upon face cards, aces, and ten spots. Twice Ellis offered to sell him the bank, but he refused, fearful lest it should change his luck. Vandover sat behind the dummy's chair, watching his game, but at length, worn out, he began to drop off to sleep, waking every now and then with a sudden leap and recoil of all his nerves. An hour later, the persistent scratching of a match awoke him. Ellis and the dummy were still playing, and the dummy was once more relighting the stump of his cigar. Ellis continued to deal, winning at almost every play. A great pile of chips and money lay at his elbow. For a few minutes, Vandover watched the dummy's game, leaning forward in his chair, his elbows on his knees. But it was evident that the dummy had lost his nerve. Ellis's continued winnings had at length demoralised him. At one time he would bet heavily on worthless cards, and at another would throw back nines and tens for no apparent reason. 
Finally, Ellis dealt him a queen, which he kept, betting ten chips. His next card was a seven spot. He signed to Ellis that he would stand. Ellis drew twenty and three cards. Vandover could not restrain an exclamation of impatience at the dummy's stupidity. What a fool a man must be to stand on seventeen with only two in the game. All at once he tossed twenty dollars across the table to Ellis, saying, Give me that in chips, I'm coming in again. Once more he resumed his seat at the table, and Ellis dealt him a hand. But Vandover's interruption had, for an instant, taken Ellis's mind from the game. He stirred in his chair and looked about the room, puffing out his cheeks and blowing between his lips. Say, this room is close enough to strangle you. Open the window behind you, Van. You're nearest to it. As Vandover raised the curtain, he uttered a cry. Look here, will you? It was morning. The city was flooded by the light of the sun already an hour high. The sky was without a cloud. Over the roofs and amongst the grey maze of telegraph wires, swarms of sparrows were chittering hoarsely. And as Vandover raised the window, he could hear the newsboys far below in the streets chanting the morning's papers. Come on, Van, exclaimed Ellis impatiently. We're waiting for you. That night decided it. From that time on, Vandover's only pleasure was gambling. Night and day he sat over the cards, the passion growing upon him as he continued to lose, for his ill luck was extraordinary. It was a veritable mania, a wild blind frenzy that knew no limit. At first he had contented himself with a game in which twenty or thirty dollars was as much as he could win or lose at a sitting, but soon this pulled upon him. He was obliged to raise the stakes continually in order to arouse in him the interest, the keen, tense excitement that his jaded nerves craved. The five hundred dollars that he had drawn from the ten thousand, the first payment on his old home, melted away within a week. Only a few years ago Vandover would have stopped to reflect upon the meaning of this, would have resisted the temptation that drew him constantly to the gambling table. But the idea of resistance never so much as occurred to him, he did not invest his fifteen thousand, but drew upon it continually to satisfy his last new craze. It was not with any hope of winning that he gambled. The desire of money was never strong in him. It was only the love of the excitement at the moment. Little by little the fifteen thousand in the bank dwindled. It did not all go in cards. Certain habits of extravagance grew upon Vandover, the natural outcome of his persistent gambling, the desire of winning easily being balanced by the impulses to spend quickly. He took a certain hysterical delight in flinging away money with both hands. Now it was the chartering of a yacht for a ten days cruise about the bay, or it was a bicycle bought one week and thrown away the next, a fresh suit of clothes each month, gloves worn but once, Gold pieces thrust into Flossie's pockets. Suppers given to booth actresses. Twenty-four hour acquaintances. A racehorse bought for eight hundred dollars, resold for two hundred and fifty. Rings and scarf pins given away to the women and girls of the Imperial. And a whole world of follies that his poor distorted wits conceived from hour to hour. His judgment was gone. His mind unbalanced. All his life Vandover had been sinking slowly lower and lower. This, however, was the beginning of the last plunge. The process of degeneration, though inevitable, had been gradual as long as he indulged generally in all forms of evil. It was only now when a passion for one particular vice absorbed him that he commenced to rush headlong to his ruin. The fifteen thousand dollars, the price of his old home, he gambled or flung away in little less than a year. He never invested it, but ate into it day after day, sometimes to pay his gambling debts, sometimes to indulge an absurd and extravagant whim, sometimes to pay his bill at the lick house, and sometimes for no reason at all, moved simply by a reckless desire for spending. End of chapter 16, part 1 Recording by Adam Wybray
Chapter Sixteen, Part Two of Vandover and the Brute. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Wybray. Vandover and the Brute by Frank Norris. Chapter Sixteen, Part Two. On the evening of a certain Thanksgiving day, nine months after he had sold the house, Vandover came in through the ladies' entrance of the Imperial, going slowly down the passageway, looking into the little rooms on his right for Ellis or the dummy. There had been a great intercollegiate football game that day, and Vandover, remembering that he had once found an interest in such things, had at first determined to see it. But toward eleven o'clock in the morning the rain had begun to fall, and Ellis, who was to have gone with him, declared that he did not care enough about the game to go out to it in the rain. Vandover was disappointed. He fancied that he could have enjoyed the game, as much as he could enjoy anything of late, but he hated to go to places alone. In the end, however, he resolved to go whether Ellis went or not. It was a holiday. Vandover had Ellis and the dummy to lunch with him at the hotel, where they arranged the menu of a famous Thanksgiving dinner for that evening. They would meet in one of the little rooms of the Imperial and go from there to the restaurant. As they were finishing their lunch, Vandover said, I got a new kind of liqueur yesterday. It has a colour like violets and smells like cologne. You fellows better come up to my room and try it. I've got to go up and change anyway. If I go out to that game. They all went up to Vandover's cheerless room and Ellis began to argue with Vandover against the folly of going anywhere in the rain. You don't want to go to that game, Van. Just look how it's raining. I bet there won't be a thousand people there. They'll probably postpone the game anyway. Say, this is queer-looking stuff. What do you call it? Creme Violette. The dummy set down his emptied liquor glass on the mantel shelf and nodded approvingly at Vandover. Then he scribbled, Out of sight. On his tablet. Tastes like cough syrup and alcohol, growled Ellis, scowling and sipping. I think a pile of this would make the dummy talk Dutch. Keep it up, dummy, he continued, articulating distinctly so that the other could catch the movement of his lips. Drink some more, make you talk. Vandover was cutting the string around a pasteboard box that had just come from his tailor's. It was a new suit of clothes, rough cheviot brown of small checks. He dressed slowly and tipped forward the swinging mirror of the bureau to see how the trousers set. Meanwhile, Ellis and the dummy had got out the cards and chips from the drawer of the centre table and had begun a game. Better change your mind, Van, said Ellis, without raising his eyes from the cards. No, sir, answered Van. You don't know how it is. You never were a college man. Why, I wouldn't miss a football game for anything. Talk about your horse racing, talk about your baseball. I tell you, there's nothing in the world so exciting as a hot football game. He swung into his long, high-coloured waterproof and stood behind Ellis, watching his game for a moment while he tied a couple of long silk streamers to his umbrella handle. It's one of the college colours, he explained. Seems like old times back at Harvard. Ellis snorted with contempt. <sighs> Such kids, he growled. I saw one of the coaches go down the street a little while ago, continued Vandover, still watching Ellis shuffle and deal. There were about twenty college men on top, and they had a big bulldog all harnessed out in their colours, and they were blowing fish horns, and I tell you, it made me wish I was one of them again. Ellis did not answer. It was probable he did not hear. Both he and the dummy were settling down for a game that no doubt would last all the afternoon. Vandover made them free of his room and they often gambled there when he went away. But it invariably made Ellis nervous to have anyone stand behind his chair while he was playing. He began to move about uneasily. By and by he looked at his watch. Better get a move on, he said. You'll be late. Just a minute, answered Vandover, more and more interested in the game. I'll go on playing, don't bother about me. Oh, I saw Charlie Geary too, he continued. On another coach... There was a party of them. Charlie was with Turner Ravis on the box seat. You remember Turner Ravis, don't you, Bandy? The girl I used to go with. Hmm, there's a girl I never liked, 
observed Ellis. She always struck me as being one of these regular snobs. Ah, snob is no name for it, assented Vandover. She thought she was too damned high-toned for me. As soon as I got into that mess about Ida Wade, she threw me out. No, she didn't want to be associated with me any longer. <laughs> well, she can go to the devil. Geary's welcome to her. I thought Dolly Waite was going to marry her, said Ellis. What was the matter there? I don't know, returned Vandover. Probably Dolly Haight didn't have enough money to suit her. Guess she wants a man that'll make his pile in this town and make his way too. Ha! <laughs> you bet. Half an hour later, he was still behind Ellis's chair. Ellis had become so fidgety that he was losing steadily. Once more, he turned to Vandover, speaking over his shoulder. Come on. Come on, Van. Go along to your football. It made me nervous standing there. Vandover pushed a ten-dollar gold piece across the table to the dummy, who was banking, and said, Give me that in chips. I'm coming in. I thought you were going to the game, inquired Ellis. Ah, the devil, answered Vandover. Too much rain. They had played without interruption all that afternoon, and for once Vandover had all the luck. When they broke up about five o'clock, with the understanding to meet again in the Imperial at seven, he had won nearly a hundred dollars. When Vandover went out to keep this appointment, he found the streets especially Kearney and Market Streets, crowded. It was about half-past six. The football game was over and the college men had returned. They were everywhere, marching about in long files, chain-gang fashion, each file headed by a man beating upon a gong, or parading the sidewalks ten abreast, singing college songs or shouting their slogan. At every moment one heard the college yells answering each other from street corner to street corner. Ra ra ra. Rawr, rawr, rawr! Vandover found the Imperial crowded with students. The barroom was packed to the doors. Every one of the little rooms in the front hall was full, while Flossie and Nanny had a great party of the young fellows in one of the larger rooms in the rear. Among the crowd of the barroom, three members of the winning team, heroes with bandages about their heads, were breaking, training, smoking and drinking for the first time in many long weeks and most of the college men were gathered into the hotels and cafes eating dinner. About an hour later they would reappear again for a moment on their way to the theatre, which they were to attend in a body. But Vandover suddenly discovered that he could not eat a mouthful. The smell of food revolted him, and little by little an irregular twitching had overcome his hands and forearms. He had received a great shock. The same evening, as he was leaving the hotel, the clerk at the office had handed him some letters that had accumulated in his box. Vandover could never think to ask for his mail in the morning as he went into breakfast. Something was surely wrong with his head of late. Every day he found it harder and harder to remember things. There were three letters altogether. One was the tailor's bill, mailed the same day that his last suit had been finished. A second was an advertisement announcing the near opening of the Sutro baths they were building at that time and the third a notice from the bank calling his attention to the fact that his account was overdrawn by some sixty dollars. At first, Vandover did not see the meaning of this notice, and thrust it back in his pocket together with the tailor's bill. Then slowly, an idea struggled into his mind. Was it possible that he no longer had any money at the bank? Was his fifteen thousand gone? From time to time, his bank book had been balanced, and invariably, during the first days of each month, his cheques had come back to him, used and crumpled, covered with strange signatures, and stamped in blue ink. But after the first few months, he had never paid the least attention to these. He never kept accounts, having a veritable feminine horror of figures. But it was absurd to think that his money was gone. Pshaw! One could not spend fifteen thousand in nine months! It was preposterous. This notice was some technicality that he could not understand. He would look into it the next day. And so he dismissed the wearisome matter from his mind with a shrug of his shoulders, as though ridding himself for some troublesome burden. However, the idea persisted. Somehow, between the lines of the printed form, he smelt out a fresh disaster. He read it over again and again. 
All at once, as he stood in the doorway of the hotel, turning up the collar of his waterproof and watching the little pools in the hollows of the asphalt pavement to see if it were still raining, the conviction came upon him. In a second he knew that he was ruined. The true meaning of the notice became apparent with the swiftness of a great flash of light. He had spent his fifteen thousand dollars. The blow was strong enough, sudden enough to penetrate even Vandover's clouded and distorted wits. His nerves were gone in a minute. A sudden stupefying numbness fell upon his brain, and the fear of something unknown, the immense unreasoning terror that had gripped him for the first time the morning after Ida Wade's suicide, came back upon him, horrible, crushing, so that he had to shut his teeth against a wild hysterical desire to rush through the street screaming and waving his arms. By the time the three friends had reached the restaurant where they were to eat their Thanksgiving dinner, Vandover's appetite had given place to a loathing of the very smell of food. His nervousness was fast approaching hysteria. The little nerve clusters all over his body seemed to be crisping and writhing like balls of tiny serpents. At intervals he would twitch sharply, as though startled at some sudden noise, his breath coming short, his heart beating quick. They had their dinner in one of the private rooms of the restaurant on the second floor. All through the meal, Vandover struggled to keep himself in hand, fighting with all his strength against this reappearance of his old enemy, this sudden return of the dreadful crisis, determined not to make an exhibition of himself before the others. He pretended to eat, and forced himself to talk, joining in with Ellis, who was badgering the dummy about Flossie. The proper thing to do was to fill the dummy's glass while his attention was otherwise absorbed, and in the end to get him so drunk that he could talk. Toward the end of the dinner, Ellis was successful. All at once the dummy got upon his feet, his eyes were glazed with drunkenness. He swayed about in an irregular circle, holding up, now by the table, now by the chair back, and now by the wall behind him. He was very angry, exasperated beyond control by Ellis's railway and abuse. He forgot himself and uttered a series of peculiar cries, very faint and shrill, like the sounds of a voice heard through a telephone when some imperfection of transmission prevents one from distinguishing the words. His mouth was wide open, and his tongue rolled about in an absurd way between his teeth. Now and then one could catch a word or two. Ellis went into spasms of laughter, holding his sides, gasping for breath. Vandover could not help being amused, and the two laughed at the dummy's stammering rage until their breath was spent. Throughout the rest of the evening, the dummy recommenced from time to time, rising unsteadily to his feet, shaking his fists, pouring out a stream of little ineffectual bird-like twitterings, trying to give Ellis abuse for abuse, trying to talk long after it had ceased to amuse the other two. Ellis had been drinking for nearly six hours, without the liquor producing the slightest effect upon him, Long since the dummy was hopelessly drunk, and now Vandover, who had been drinking upon an empty stomach, began to grow very noisy and boisterous. Little by little Ellis himself commenced to lose his self-control. By and by he and Vandover began to sing, each independent of the other, very hoarse and loud. The dummy joined them, making a hideous and lamentable noise, which so affected Ellis that he pretended to howl at it like a little dog overcome by mournful music. But suddenly Ellis had an idea, crying out thickly between two hiccups. Hey there, Van, do your dog act for us. Go on, bark for us. By this time Vandover was very nearly out of his head, his drunkenness finishing what his nervousness had begun. The attack was fast approaching culmination. Strange and unnatural fancies began to come and go in his brain. Go on, Van urged Ellis, his eyes heavy with alcohol. Go on, do your dog act. All at once, it was as though an angry dog were snarling and barking over a bone there under the table about their feet. Ellis roared with laughter, but suddenly he himself was drunk. All the afternoon he had kept himself in hand. Now his intoxication came upon him in a moment. The skin around his eyes was purple and swollen, the pupils themselves were contracted. They grew darker, taking on the colour of bitumen. 
Suddenly he swept glasses, plates, caster, knives, forks, and all from off the table with a single movement of his arm. Then the alcohol overcame him all in an instant like a poisonous gas. He swayed forward in his chair and fell across the stripped table, his head rolling inertly between his outstretched arms. He did not move again. In a neighbouring room, young Haight had been dining with some college fellows, fraternity men, all friends of his, upon whose coach he had ridden to and from the game. He had heard Vandover and Ellis in the room across the hall and had recognised their voices. Haight had never been a friend of Ellis, but no one, not even Turner, had grieved more over Vandover's ruin than had his old-time college chum. Young Haight heard the noise of the falling crockery as Ellis swept the table clear, and turned his head sharply, listening. There was a moment's silence after this, and Haight, fearing some accident had happened, stepped out into the hall and stood there a moment listening again, his head inclined toward the closed door. He heard no groaning, no exclamations of pain, not even any noise of conversation. Only through the closed door came a steady sound of barking. Puzzled, he tried the door, and, finding it locked as he had expected, put one foot upon the knob, and, catching hold of the top jam, raised himself up and looked down through the open space that answered for a transom. The room was very warm the air thick with the smell of cooked food, the fumes of whisky, and the acrid odour of cigar smoke. Ellis had rolled from his chair, and lay upon the floor, sprawling on his face in the wreck of the table. Near to him, likewise upon the floor, but sitting up, his back against the wall, was the dummy. He was muttering incessantly to himself, as if delighted at having found his tongue, his head swaying on his shoulders, and a strange murmur, soft, bird-like, meaningless like sounds heard from a vast distance, coming from his wide open mouth. Vandover was sitting bolt upright in his chair, his hands gripping the table, his eyes staring straight before him. He was barking incessantly. It was evident that now he could not stop himself. It was like hysterical laughter, a thing beyond his control. Twice, young White called him by name, kicking the door as a leg hung against it. At last Vandover heard him. Then, as he caught sight of his face over the door, he raised his upper lip above his teeth and snarled at him, long and viciously. As Haight dropped down into the hall, a waiter came running up. He, too, had heard the noise of the breaking dishes. As he thrust his key into the lock, he paused a moment, listening and looking in a puzzled way at young Haight. They have a dog in here, then? They had no dog when they came. That's funny. Open the door, said young Haight quietly. Once inside, Haight went directly to Vandover, crying out, Come! Come on, Van! Come home with me! Vandover started suddenly, looking about him bewildered, drawing his hand across his face. Home, he repeated vaguely. Yes, that's the idea. Let's go home. I want to go to bed. Hello, Dolly. Where did you come from? Say, Dolly, let me tell you. Listen here. Come down here close. You mustn't mind me. You know, I'm a wolf, mostly. They went down toward the lick house. Vandover grew steadier after a few minutes in the open air. Young Haight locked arms with him. They went on together in silence. By this time the streets were crowded again, the theatres were open, and the college men were once more at large. Now they were all gathered together into one immense procession, headed by a brass band in a brewer's wagon, and they tramped aimlessly to and fro about Kearney and Market Streets, making a hideous noise. At the head the band was playing a popular quickstep with a great banging of a bass drum. The college men in the front ranks were singing one song, those in the rear another, while the middle of the column was given over to an abominable medley of fish horns, policemen's rattles, and great Chinese gongs. At stated intervals the throng would halt and give the college yell. Dolly, you and I used to do that, said Vandover, looking after the procession. He had himself well in hand by this time. What was the matter with me back there at the restaurant, Dolly? 
he asked after a while. Oh, you've been drinking a good deal, I guess, answered young Haight. You... you had some queer idea about yourself. Yes, I know, answered Vandover quickly. Fancied I was some kind of a beast, didn't I? Some kind of wolf. I have that notion sometimes, and I can't get it out of my head. It's curious just the same. They went up to Vandover's room. Vandover lit the gas. But he could hardly keep back an exclamation as the glare suddenly struck young Haight's face. What in heaven's name was the matter with his old-time chum? He seemed to be blighted, shattered, struck down by some terrible, overwhelming calamity. A dreadful anguish looked through his eyes. The sense of a hopeless misery had drawn and twisted his face. There could be no doubt that something had made shipwreck of his life. Vandover was looking at a ruined man. "'My God, Dolly!' exclaimed Vandover. "'What's happened to you? "'You look like a death's head, man. "'What's gone wrong? "'Aren't you well?' Height caught his friend's searching gaze, and for a moment they looked at each other without speaking. There was no mistaking the fearful grief that smouldered behind Height's dull, listless eyes. For a moment Vandover thought of Turner Ravis. But even if she had turned him off, that alone would not account for his friend's fearful condition of mind and body. "'What is it, Dolly?' persisted Vandover. "'We used to be pretty good chums, not so long ago.' They sat down on the edge of the bed, and for a moment their positions seemed reversed. Height, the one to be protected and consoled, Vandover, the shielding and self-reliant one. Young Height passed his hand over his face before he answered, and Vandover noticed that his fingers trembled like an old man's. Do you remember that night, Van, when you and Charlie and I all went over to Turner's house, and we had tomatoes and beer, and a glass broke in that peculiar way, and I cut my lip? Vandover nodded, forcing his attention against the alcoholic fumes to follow his friend's words. We went down to the Imperial afterward, White continued, and ran into Ellis, and we had something more to eat. Do you remember that as we sat there, Toby, the waiter, brought Flossie in, and she sat there with us a while? He paused, choosing his words. Vandover listened closely, trying to recall the incident. She kissed me, said young Haight slowly, and the court plaster came off. You know I never had anything to do with women, Van. I always tried to keep away from them, but that's where my life practically came to an end. You mean, began Vandover, you mean that you, that Flossie? Wait, nodded. Good God, I can't believe it. It's not possible. I know Flossie. Haight shook his head, smiling grimly. I can't help that, Van, said he. There's no denying facts. There's no other possible explanation. As soon as I knew, I went to the doctors here, and then I went to New York for treatment. But there's no hope. I didn't know, you see. I didn't believe it possible. Turner Ravis and I were engaged. I waited too long. There's only one escape for me now. His voice dropped. He stared for a moment at the floor. Then he straightened up and said in a different tone, But damn it, Van, let's not talk about it. I'm haunted with the thing day and night. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you seriously. You know you're ruining yourself, old man. For Vandover interrupted him with a gesture, saying, don't go on, Dolly. It isn't the least use. There was a time for that, but that was long ago. I used to care. I used to be sorry and all that, but I'm not now. Ruining myself? Why? I have ruined myself long ago. We're both ruined. Only in your case, it wasn't your fault. It's too late for me now. And I'm not even sorry that it is too late. Dolly, I don't want to pull up. You can't imagine a man falling as low as that, can you? I couldn't imagine it myself a few years ago. I'm going right straight to the devil now. And you might as well stand aside and give me a free course, for I'm bound to get there sooner or later. I suppose you'd think that a man who could see this as plainly as I do would be afraid, 
would have remorse and all that sort of thing. Well, I did at first. I'll never forget the night when I first saw it. Came near shooting myself. But I got over it. Now I'm used to the idea. Dolly, I can get used to almost anything. Nothing makes much difference to me nowadays. Only, I like to play cards. Look here, he went on, laying out the notice for the bank upon the table. This came today. See what it is. I sold the old house on California Street. Well, I've gambled away that money in less than a year. It seems that I'm a financial ruin now, but... And he began to laugh. I live through it somehow. The news didn't prevent me from getting drunk tonight. After young Haight was gone, Vandover went to bed, turning out the gas and drawing down the window half shut from the top. The wine had made him sleepy. He was dropping away into a very grateful doze, and a sudden shock, a violent leap of every nerve in his body, brought him up to a sitting position, gasping for breath, his heart fluttering, his hands beating at the empty air. He settled down again, turning upon his pillow, closing his eyes, very weary, longing for a good night's sleep. Dolly Haight's terrible story, his unjustified fate, and the hopeless tragedy of it, came back to him. Vandover would gladly have changed places with him. Young Haight had the affection and respect of even those that knew. He, Vandover, had thrown away his friend's love and their esteem with the rest of the things he had once valued. His thoughts, released from all control of his will, began to come and go through his head with incredible rapidity. Confused ideas, half-remembered scenes, incidents of the past few days, bits and ends of conversation recalled for no especial reason, all galloping across his brain like a long herd of terrified horses. An excitement grew upon him, a strange thrill of exhilaration. He was broad awake now. But suddenly his left leg, his left arm and wrist, all his left side jerked with the suddenness of a sprung trap, so violent was the shock that the entire bed shook and creaked with it. Then the inevitable reaction followed. The slow crisping and torsion of his nerves, twisting upon each other like a vast swarm of tiny serpents. It seemed to begin with his ankles, spreading slowly to every part of his body. It was a veritable torture, so poignant that Vandover groaned under it, shutting his eyes. He could not keep quiet a second. To lie in bed was an impossibility. He threw the bedclothes from him and sprang up. He did not light the gas, but threw on his bathrobe and began to walk the floor. Even as he walked, his eyelids drooped lower and lower. The need of sleep overcame him like a narcotic. But as soon as he was about to lose himself, he would be suddenly and violently awakened by the same shock, the same jangling recoil of his nerves. Then his hands and head seemed to swell. Next, it was as though the whole room was too small for him. He threw open the window, and, leaning upon his elbows, looked out. The clouds had begun to break. The rain was gradually ceasing, leaving in the air a damp, fresh smell, the smell of wet asphalt and the odour of dripping woodwork. It was warm. The atmosphere was dank, heavy, tepid. One or two stars were out and a faint grey light showed him the vast reach of roofs below, stretching away to meet the abrupt rise of Telegraph Hill. Not far off, the slender, graceful smokestack puffed steadily, throwing off continually the little flock of white jets that rose into the air very brave and gay, but in the end dwindled irresolutely, discouraged, disheartened, fading sadly away, vanishing under the night, like illusions disappearing at the first touch of the outside world. As Vandover leaned from his window, looking out into the night with eyes that saw nothing, the college slogan rose again from the great crowd of students who still continued to hold the streets. Ra 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 He turned back into the room, groping among the bottles on his washstand for his bromide of potassium. As he poured out the required dose into the teaspoon, his hand twitched again sharply, flirting the medicine over his bared neck and chest, exposed by the bathrobe, which he had left open at the throat. It was cold, and he shivered a bit as he wiped it dry with the back of his hand. He knew very well that his nervous attack was coming on again. As he set down the bottle upon the washstand, he muttered to himself, 
Now I'm going to have an eye of it. He began to walk the floor again, with great strides, fighting with all his pitiful, shattered mind against the increasing hysteria, trying to keep out of his brain the strange hallucination that assailed it from time to time, the hallucination of a thing four-footed, a thing that sulked and snarled. The hotel grew quiet. A watchman went down the hall, turning out each alternate gas jet. Just outside of the door was a burner in a red globe, fixed at a stair landing to show the exit in case of fire. This burned all night, and it streamed through the transom of Vandover's room, splotching the ceiling with a great square of red light. Vandover was in a torment, overcome now by that same fear with which he had at last become so familiar, the unreasoning terror of something unknown. He uttered an exclamation, a suppressed cry of despair, of misery, and then suddenly checked himself, astonished, seized with the fancy that his cry was not human, was not of himself, but of something four-footed, the snarl of some exasperated brute. He paused abruptly in his walk, listening for what he did not know. The silence of the great city spread itself around him, like the still waters of some vast lagoon. Through the silence he heard the noise of the throng of college youths. They were returning, doubling upon their line of march. A long puff of tepid air, breathing through the open window, brought to his ears the distant, joyous sound of their slogan. Ra, ra, ra! Ra, ra, ra! They passed by along the adjacent street, their sounds growing faint. Vandover took up his restless pacing again. Little by little the hallucination gained upon him. Little by little his mind slipped from his grasp. The wolf, the beast, whatever the creature was, seemed in his diseased fancy to grow stronger in him from moment to moment. But of all his strength he fought against it, fought against this strange mania that overcame him at these periodical intervals, fought with his hands so tightly clenched that the knuckles grew white, that the nails bit into the palm. It seemed to him that in some way his personality divided itself into three. There was himself, the real Vandover of every day, the same familiar Vandover that looked back at him from his mirror. Then there was the wolf, the beast, whatever the creature was that lived in his flesh, and that struggled with him now, striving to gain the ascendancy, to absorb the real Vandover into its own hideous identity. And last of all, there was a third self, formless, very vague, elusive, that stood aside and watched the strife of the other two. But as he fought against his madness, concentrating all his attention with a tremendous effort of the will, the queer numbness that came upon his mind whenever he exerted it, enwrapped his brain like a fog. And this third self grew vaguer than ever, dwindled and disappeared. Somehow it seemed to be associated with consciousness, for after this the sense of the reality of things grew dim and blurred to him. He ceased to know exactly what he was doing. His intellectual parts dropped away one by one, leaving only the instincts, the blind, unreasoning impulses of the animal. Still, he continued his restless, lurching walk back and forth in his room, his head hanging low and swinging from side to side with the movement of his gait. He had become so nervous that the restraint imposed upon his freedom of movement by his bathrobe and his loose nightclothes chafed and irritated him. At length, he had stripped off everything. Suddenly, and without the slightest warning, Vandover's hands came slowly above his head and he dropped forward, landing upon his palms. All in an instant he had given way, yielding in a second to the strange hallucination of that four-footed thing that sulked and snarled. Now, without a moment's stop, he ran back and forth along the wall of the room, upon the palms of his hands and his toes, a ludicrous figure, like that of certain clowns one sees at the circus, contortionists walking about the sawdust, imitating some kind of enormous dog. Still he swung his head from side to side at the motion of his shuffling gait, his eyes dull and fixed. At long intervals he uttered a sound, half word, half cry. Woof! Woof! but it was muffled, indistinct, raucous, coming more from his throat than from his lips. It might easily have been the growl of an animal. A long time passed. Naked, four-footed, 
Vandover ran back and forth the length of the room. By an hour after midnight, the sky was clear. All the stars were out. The moon, a thin, low-swinging scimitar, set behind the black mass of the roofs of the city, leaving a pale, bluish light that seemed to come from all quarters of the horizon. As the great stillness grew more and more complete, the persistent puffing of the slender tin stack, the three gay and joyous little noises, each sounding like a note of discreet laughter interrupted by a cough, became clear and distinct. Inside the room there was no sound, except the persistent patter of something four-footed going up and down. At length, even this sound ceased abruptly. Worn out, Vandover had just fallen, dropping forward upon his face with a long breath. He lay still, sleeping at last. The remnant of the great band of college men went down an adjacent street, raising their cadent slogan for the last time. It came through the open window, softened as it were by the warm air, thick with damp through which it travelled. Ra ra ra, ra ra ra. Naked, exhausted, Vandover slept profoundly, stretched at full length at the foot of the bare white wall of the room beneath two of the little placards, scrawled of ink, that read, Stove here, Mona Lisa here. End of chapter 16, part 2 Recording by Adam Wybray Chapter 17 of Vandover and the Brute. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Vandover and the Brute by Frank Norris. Chapter 17. On a certain Saturday morning two years later, Vandover awoke in his room at the Reno house, the room he had now occupied for fifteen months. One might almost say that he had been expelled from the Lick House. For a time he had tried to retain his room there with the idea of paying his bills by the money he should win at gambling. But his bad luck was now become a settled thing. Almost invariably he lost. At last Ellis and the dummy had refused to play with him, since he was never able to pay them when they won. They had had a great quarrel. Ellis broke with him sullenly, growling wrathfully under his heavy mustache, and the dummy had written upon his pad, so hastily and angrily that the words could hardly be read, that he would not play with professional gamblers, men who supported themselves by their winnings. Damn it, one had to be a gentleman. Next, Vandover had tried to borrow some money of Charlie Geary. Geary had told him that he could not afford as much as Vandover needed. Then Vandover became enraged. He had long since seen that Geary had practically swindled him out of his block in the mission, and at that very moment the huge boot and shoe concern was completing the factory built upon the ground that Vandover had once owned. Geary had cleared $7,000 on his deal. His refusal to loan his old-time friend $50 upon this occasion had exasperated Vandover out of all bounds. There was a scene. Vandover told Geary what he thought of his deal in very plain words. They shouted swindler and gambler into each other's faces. The whole office was aroused. Vandover was ejected by force. On a stair landing halfway to the street, he sat down and cried into his arms, folded upon his knees. When he returned to his room, he had a sudden return of his dreadful, nervous malady and barked and whined under the bed. Then Vandover wrote a $50 check on the bank, the same bank that had just notified him that he was overdrawn, and passed it upon young Haight. How he came to do the thing he could not tell. It might have been the influence of Geary's successful robbery, or it might have been that he had at last lost all principle, all sense of honor and integrity. At any rate, he could not bring himself to feel very sorry. He knew that young Haight would not prosecute him for the dishonesty. He traded upon Haight's magnanimity. He only felt glad that he had the fifty dollars. But by this time Vandover did not even wonder at his own baseness and degradation. A few years ago this would have been the case. Now his character was so changed that the theft seemed somehow consistent. He had destroyed young Haight's friendship for him. He had cast from him his college chum, his best friend, but neither did this affect him. Nothing made much difference to him now. Nevertheless, Vandover was evicted from the Lick House three days after he had stolen young Haight's money. 
instead of paying his bills with the amount he gambled it away in a back room of a new cafe on market street with toby the red-eyed waiter from the imperial and a certain german professor a billiard marker who wore a waistcoat figured with little designs of the eiffel tower and who was a third owner in a trotting mare named tomato ketchup vandover was now left with only his bonds his u s four per cents these brought him in but sixty nine dollars a quarter or as he had had it arranged twenty three dollars a month just at this time as if by a miracle a veritable god from the machine vandover's lawyer mr field found him an opportunity to earn some money for the first and only time in his life vandover knew what it was to work for a living the work that field secured for him was the work of painting those little pictures on the lacquered surface of iron safes those little oval landscapes between the lines of red and gold lettering landscapes rugged gorges ocean steamships under all sail mountain lakes with sailboats careening upon their surfaces the boat indicated by two little triangular dabs of chinese white one for the sail itself and the other for its reflection in the water sometimes even he was called upon to paint other little pictures upon the sides of big express wagons two horses one white and the other bay galloping very free in an open field their manes and tails flying or a bulldog very savage sitting upon a green and black safe or the head of a mastiff with a spiked collar about his neck what with the pay for this sort of work and the interest of his bonds vandover managed to lead a haphazard sort of life living about in cheap lodging houses and cheap restaurants but he was never more than a second-class workman and he was so irregular that he could never be depended upon the moment he began to paint again even to paint such pitiful little pictures as these the same familiar experience repeated itself the unwillingness of his fingers their failure to rightly interpret his ideas the resulting crudity of his work the sudden numbness in his brain the queer tense sensation behind his eyes but vandover had long since become accustomed to these symptoms and would not have minded them at this time had it not been that they were occasionally followed by a nervous twitching and jerking of his whole arm so that sometimes he could not hold the brush steady a minute at a time for two years he had drifted about the city living now here and now there a real hand-to-mouth existence sinking a little lower each day now no one knew him he had completely passed out of the lives of hate geary and ellis just as before he had passed out of the life of turner ravis at the end of the first year they had ceased even to think about him for a long time they thought that he was dead until one day ellis declared that he had seen him far down on kearney street near the barbary coast looking at the pictures in the illustrated weeklies that were tacked upon the show board on the sidewalk in front of his stationers ellis had told the others that on this occasion vandover seemed to be more sickly than ever he described his appearance in detail wagging his head at his own story pursing his lips putting his chin in the air vandover had worn an old paint-stained pair of blue trousers fastened with a strap so that his shirt showed below his vest he had no collar and he had allowed his beard to grow a straggling thin beard through which one could see the buttons of his shirt a dirty beard full of the cracker crumbs from the free lunch counters of cheap saloons he had on a hat which he had worn when they had known him but one should see that hat now it was all true little by little vandover had abandoned all interest in his personal appearance of course it was impossible for him to dress well at this time but he had even lost regard for decency and cleanliness he washed himself but rarely he had even acquired the habit of sleeping with all his clothes on during the colder nights of the year nothing made any difference gradually his mind grew more and more clouded he became stupid sluggish he went about the city from dawn to dark his feet dragging his head hanging low and swinging from side to side with the motion of his gait he rarely spoke his eyes took on a dull glazed appearance filmy like the eyes of a dead fish at certain intervals his mania came upon him the strange hallucination of something four-footed the persistent fancy that the brute in him had now grown so large so insatiable that it had taken everything even to his very self his own identity that he had literally become the brute the attack passed off and left him wondering perplexed the reno house where vandover had lived for some fifteen months was a sort of hotel on sacramento street below kearney the neighborhood was low just on the edge of the barbary coast abounding in stores for second-hand clothing saloons pawn shops gun stores bird stores and the shops of chinese cobblers around the corner on kearney street was a concert hall a dive to which the admission was free nearby was the old plaza underneath the hotel on the ground floor were two saloons a barber shop and a broom manufactory the lodgers themselves were for the most part transient sailors lounging about shore between two voyages swedes and danes farmhands grape-pickers and cow-punchers from distant parts of the state 
a few lost women and japanese cooks and second boys remaining there while they advertised for positions vandover sank to the grade of these people at once with that fatal adaptability to environment which he had permitted himself to foster throughout his entire life and which had led him to be contented in almost any circumstances it was as if the brute in him were forever seeking a lower level wallowing itself lower and lower into the filth and into the mire content to be foul content to be prone to be inert and supine it was saturday morning about a quarter of nine the wet season had begun early that year though this was but the middle of september the rain had fallen steadily since the previous wednesday its steady murmur prolonged and soothing like the purring of a great cat filled vandover's room with a pleasant sound the air of the room was thick and foul heavy with the odor of cooking onions and stale bedding it was very warm there was no ventilation vandover lay upon the bed half awake dozing under the thick coarse blankets and soiled counterpane with the exception of his shoes and coat he wore all his clothes he was glad to be warm to be stupefied by the heat of the bedding and the bad air of the room in the next room a portuguese fruit vendor very drunk was fighting with the tin pitcher and pasteboard bowl on his washstand trying to wet his head swearing and making a hideous clatter at length he tipped them over upon the floor and gave the pitcher a great kick the noise roused vandover he sat up in bed stretching rubbing his hands over his face about the same moment the clock in the office downstairs struck nine vandover let his feet drop to the floor and sat on the edge of the bed looking vaguely about him his face ordinarily very pale was oily from sleep and red upon one side from long contact with the pillow the marks of the creases still showing upon his cheek his long straight hair fell about his eyes and ears like a tangled mane a thin straggling beard and moustache of a brown much lighter than his hair covered the lower part of his face his nose was long and pinched while brown and puffed pockets hung beneath his eyes he wore a white shirt very crumpled and dirty a low standing collar and a black four-in-hand necktie very greasy his trousers were striped and of a slate blue color the blue pants of the ready-made clothing stores still sitting on the bed vandover continued his stupid gaze about the room the room was small and at some long forgotten almost prehistoric period had been covered with a yellowish paper stamped with a huge pattern of flowers that looked like the flora of a carboniferous strata a pattern repeated to infinity wherever the eye turned newspapers were pasted upon the ceiling and a great square of very dirty matting covered the floor there were a few pieces of furniture very old-fashioned made of pine with a black walnut veneer two chairs a washstand and the bed a great pile of old newspapers tied up with bale rope was kicked into one corner two gas brackets without globes stretched forth their long arms over the empty space where the bureau should have been under the single window was vandover's trunk and upon it his color box and pots of paint his hat hung upon a hook screwed to the door the hat had once been black but it had long since turned to a greenish hue and sweat stains were showing about the band vandover dressed slowly he straightened his hair a bit before the cheap mirror that hung over the washstand putting on his hat immediately after to keep it in place he washed his hands in the dirty water that had stood in his pasteboard bowl since the previous afternoon but left his face as it was he put on his coat an old cutaway which had been his best years ago but which now was absurdly small for him the breast all spotted and streaked with old stains of soup and gravy last of all he drew on his shoes they were new vandover had bought them two days before for a dollar and ninety cents they were lined so as to make socks superfluous it had been a bad week with vandover the paint shop had given him no work to do for ten days and he had been forced to get along in some way upon the interest of his bonds that is to say upon five dollars and seventy-five cents a week two dollars and seventy-five cents of this went for his room rent one dollar and ninety for his shoes and tuesday afternoon he had bought a package of cigarettes for ten cents by saturday morning he had spent seventy-five cents for food when the paint shop gave him enough work it was vandover's custom to buy a week's commutation ticket at a certain restaurant he never ate at the hotel it was too expensive by the commutation system he could buy two dollars and twenty-five cents worth of meals for two dollars paying in tickets at each meal but such a thing had been impossible this week he had been forced to fall back upon the free lunch system in two years vandover had learned a great deal even his dulled wits had been sharpened when it had come to a question of food the brute in him might destroy all his finer qualities but even the brute had to feed when work failed him at the beginning of the week vandover was not unprepared for the contingency the thing had happened before and he knew how to meet it on monday he beat up and down the barbary coast picking out fifteen or twenty saloons which supported a free lunch counter in connection with the bar 
he took his breakfast monday morning at the first of these he paid five cents for a glass of beer and ate his morning's meal at the lunch counter stew bread and cheese at noon he made his dinner at the second saloon on his route here he had another glass of beer a great plate of soup potato salad and pretzels thus he managed to feed himself throughout the week it was always his great desire to feed well at sunday's dinner to spend at least a quarter on that meal it was something to be looked forward to throughout the entire week but to get twenty-five cents ahead when he was out of work was bitter hard that week he had started out with the determination to eat but two meals a day he would thus save five cents daily and by sunday morning would be thirty cents to the good but each day his resolution broke down at breakfast he would resolve to go without his lunch at lunch he would make up his mind to go without supper and at supper he would tell himself that now at least his determination was irrevocable he would eat no breakfast the next morning but on each and every occasion his hunger proved too strong his feet carried him irresistibly to the saloon lunch counters whether he would or no at no time in his life had vandover accustomed himself to self-denial he could hardly begin now at length saturday morning had come and while he was dressing he realized that he could not look forward to any unusual dinner the next day at noon the disappointment had all the force of an unexpected disaster and he began keenly to regret his weakness of the past week suddenly vandover resolved that he would go without food all that day it would be saving fifteen cents which added to the five cents he would spend anyway for his dinner would almost make a quarter he knew where he could dine excellently well for twenty cents however he could not make up his mind to go without his sunday morning's breakfast that he told himself he must eat once dressed vandover went out fortunately the rain had stopped he went on down through the reeking steaming streets to one of the big fruit markets not far from the waterfront the portuguese fruit vendor who roomed next to him at the reno house was employed at a stall here vandover knew him a little and it was not hard for him to get a thin slice of coconut out from the inside rind of one of those that were lying cracked open among his other wares all the morning vandover chewed the slice of coconut at the same time drinking a great deal of water for hours he deadened the pang of hunger by this means he passed the time for the most part sitting on the benches in the plaza reading an old newspaper that he had found under a seat the sun came out a little vandover found the warmth very grateful he told himself that he could easily hold out until the next morning he had forgotten about the time and was surprised when the whistles all over town began to blow for noon in an instant vandover was hungry again it was all one that he chewed the little pulp of coconut rind more vigorously than ever swallowed great draughts of water at the public fountains the little gnawing just between his chest and his stomach began to persist he got up and began to walk he left the plaza behind him crossed kearney street and went on down clay street till he reached the waterfront for a time he found a certain diversion among the shipping and especially in watching a gang of calkers knocking away at the seams of an immense coal steamer he sat upon a great iron clamped pile spitting into the yellow water below the air was full of the smell of bilge and oakum and fish the thousands of masts made a gray maze against the sky occasionally an empty truck trundled over the hollow docks with a sound of distant cannon a weakness a little trembling that seemed to come from the pit of his stomach began upon vandover he was very hungry evidently the slice of coconut was no longer effective he swallowed it and lit a cigarette one of the half dozen still left of the pack he had bought the tuesday before he smoked the cigarette slowly inhaling as much of the smoke as he could this quieted him for an hour but he had the folly to smoke again at the end of that time and at once as he might have known was hungry again until dark he struggled along drinking water continually chewing chips of wood toothpicks bits of straw anything so that the action of his jaws might cheat the demands of his stomach toward half past seven in the evening he returned to his room in the reno house if he could get to sleep that would be best of all on the stairs of the hotel while going up to his room the strong smell of cooking onions came suddenly to his nostrils it was delicious vandover breathed in the warm savor with the long sighs closing his eyes a great feebleness came over him he asked himself how he could get through the next twelve hours an hour later he went to bed hiccuping from the water he had been drinking all day by this time he had torn the paper from one of his cigarettes and was chewing the tobacco this was his last resort an expedient which he fell back upon only in great extremity as it invariably made him sick to his stomach he slept a little but in half an hour was broad awake again gagging and retching dreadfully there was nothing on his stomach to throw up and now at length the hunger in him raged like a wolf vandover was in veritable torment he could not keep his thoughts away from the money in his pocket 
a nickel and two dimes. He could eat if he wanted to, could satisfy this incessant craving. At every moment the temptation grew stronger. Why should he wait until morning? He had the money. It was only a matter of a few minutes' walk to the nearest saloon. But he set his face against this desire. He had held out so long that it would be a pity to give in now. He was not so very hungry after all. No, no, he would not give in. He was strong enough. As long as he used his will, he need not succumb. It was just a question of asserting his strength of mind, of calling up the better part of him. Even better than eating would be the satisfaction of knowing that he had shown himself stronger than his lower animal appetite. No, he would not give in. Hardly a minute after he had arrived at this resolution, Vandover found himself drawing on his coat and shoes, making ready to go out, to go out and eat. The gas in the room was lit, his money, the nickel and two dimes, was shut in one of his fists. He was dressing himself with one hand, dressing with feverish, precipitate haste. What had happened? He marveled at himself, but did not check his preparations an instant. He could not stop, whether he would or no. There was something in him stronger than himself, something that urged him on his feet, that drove him out into the street, something that clamored for food and that would not be gainsaid. It was the animal in him, the brute, that would be fed, the evil, hideous brute grown now so strong that Vandover could not longer resist it the brute that had long since destroyed all his finer qualities but that still demanded to be fed still demanded to live all the little money that vandover had saved during the day he spent that night among the coffee houses the restaurants and the saloons of the barbary coast continuing to eat even after his hunger was satisfied toward daylight he returned to his room and all dressed as he was flung himself face downward among the coarse blankets and greasy counterpane for nearly eight hours he slept profoundly, with long snores, prone, inert, crammed and gorged with food. It was the middle of Sunday afternoon when he awoke. He roused himself, and going over to the plaza, sat for a long while upon one of the benches. It was a very bright afternoon, and Vandover sat motionless for a long time in the sun, while his heavy meal digested, very happy, content merely to be warm, to be well fed, to be comfortable. End of chapter 17Chapter 18, Part 1 of Vandover and the Brute. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Vandover and the Brute by Frank Norris. Chapter 18, Part 1. That winter passed, then the summer. September and October came and went, and by the middle of November the rains set in. One very wet afternoon toward the end of the month, Charlie Geary sat at his desk in his own private office. He was unoccupied for the moment, leaning back in his swivel chair, his feet on the table, smoking a cigar. Geary had broken from his old-time habit of smoking only so many cigars as he could pay for by saving car fare. He was doing so well now he could afford to smoke whenever he chose. He was still with the great firm of Beale and Story, and while not in the partnership as yet, had worked up to the position of an assistant. He had cases of his own now, a great many of them, for the most part damage suits against that certain enormous corporation whom it was said was ruining the city and entire state. Geary posed as one of its bitterest enemies, pushing each suit brought against it with a tireless energy, with a zeal that was almost vindictive. He began to fit into his own niche in the eyes of the public, and just in proportion as the corporation was hated, Geary was admired. Money came to him very fast. He was hardly thirty at this time, but could already be called a rich man. His deal with Vandover had given him a taste for real estate, and now and then, with the greatest caution, he made a few discreet investments. At present, he had just completed a row of small cottages across the street from the boot and shoe factory. The cottages held two rooms and a large kitchen. Geary had calculated that the boot and shoe concern would employ nearly a thousand operatives, and he had built his row with the view of accommodating a few of them who had families and who desired to live near the factory. His agents were Adams and Brunt. It was toward half-past five, there was nothing more that Geary could do that day, and for a moment he leaned back in his swivel chair, before going home, smiling a little, very well pleased with himself. He was still as clever and shrewd as ever, still devoured with an incarnate ambition, still delighted when he could get the better of anyone. 
he was yet a young man with the start he had secured for himself and with the exceptional faculties the faculties of self-confidence and push that he knew himself to possess there was no telling to what position he might attain he knew that it was only a question of time of a short time even when he would be the practical head of the great firm everything he turned his hand to was a success his row of houses in the mission might be enlarged to a veritable settlement for every workman in the neighborhood his youth his cleverness and his ambition supported by his money on the one hand and on the other by the vast machinery of the great law firm could raise him to a great place in the world of men gazing through the little blue haze of his cigar smoke he began to have vague ideas ideas of advancement of political successes politics fascinated him such a field of action seemed to be the domain for which he was precisely suited not the politics of the city or of the state not the nasty little squabbling of boodlers lobbyists and supervisors but something large something inspiring something on a tremendous scale something to which one could give up one's whole life and energy something to which one could sacrifice everything friendships fortunes scruples principles life itself no matter what anything to be a success to arrive to get there to attain the desired object in spite of the whole world to ride on at it trampling down or smashing through everything that stood in the way blind deaf fists and teeth shut tight not the little squabbling politics of the city or state but national politics the sway and government of a whole people the house the senate the cabinet and the next why not the highest the best of all the executive yes geary aspired even to the presidency for a moment he allowed himself the indulgence of the delightful dream then laughed a bit at his own absurdity but even the entertainment of so vast an idea had made his mind as it were big it was hard to come down to the level again in spite of himself he went on reasoning in stupendous thoughts in enormous ideas figuring with immense abstractions and then after all why not other men had striven and attained other men were even now striving other men would arrive why should not he every man for himself that was his maxim it might be the damned selfish but it was human nature the weakest to the wall the strongest to the front why should not he be in the front why not in the very front rank why not be even before the front rank itself the leader vast vague ideas passed slowly across the vision of his mind ideas that could hardly be formulated into thought ideas of the infinite herd of humanity driven on as if by some enormous relentless engine driven on toward some fearful distant bourne driven on recklessly at headlong speed all life was but a struggle to keep from under those myriad spinning wheels that dashed so close behind those were happiest who were farthest to the front to lag behind was peril to fall was to perish to be ridden down to be beaten to the dust to be inexorably crushed and blotted out beneath that myriad of spinning iron wheels geary looked up quickly and saw vandover standing in the doorway for the moment geary did not recognize the gaunt shambling figure with the long hair and dirty beard the greenish hat and the streaked and spotted coat but when he did it was with a feeling of anger and exasperation look here he cried don't you think you'd better knock before you come in vandover raised a hand slowly as if in deprecation and answered slowly with a feeble tremulous voice the voice of an old man i did knock mr geary i didn't mean no offense he sat down on the edge of the nearest chair looking vaguely and stupidly about on the floor moving his head instead of his eyes repeating under his breath from time to time no offense no sir no offense shut that door commanded geary vandover obeyed he wore no vest and the old cutaway coat fastened by the single remaining button exposed his shirt to view abominably filthy bulging at the waist like a blouse the blue pants held up by a strap were all foul with mud and grease and paint and there hung about him a certain odor that peculiar smell of poverty and of degradation the smell of stale clothes and of unwashed bodies well said geary abruptly vandover put the tips of his fingers to his lips and rolled his eyes about the room avoiding geary's glance then he dropped them to the floor again looking at the pattern in the carpet well repeated geary irritated you know i haven't got all the time in the world all at once vandover began to cry very softly snuffling with his nose his chin twitching the tears running through his thin sparse beard ah get on to yourself shouted geary now thoroughly disgusted quit that be a man will you stop that do you hear 
Vandover obeyed, catching his breath and slowly wiping his eyes with the side of his hand. "'I'm no good,' he said at length, wagging his head and blinking through his tears. "'I'm—I'm I'm done for, and I ain't got no money. Yet, of course, you see, I don't mean no offense. What I want, you see, is to be a man, and not give in, and not let the wolf get me, and then I'll go back to Paris. Everything goes round here, very slow, and seems far off. That's why I can't get along. And I'm that hungry that sometimes I twitch all over. I'm down. I ain't got another cent of money, and I lost my job at the paint shop. That's where I drew down twenty dollars a week painting landscapes on safes, you know, and then— Geary interrupted him, crying out. You haven't a cent. Why— what have you done with your bonds? Bonds? repeated Vandover, dazed and bewildered. I ain't never had any bonds. What bonds? Oh, yes, he exclaimed, suddenly remembering. Yes, I know, my bonds, of course. Yes, yes. Well, I, those, those, I had to sell those bonds. Had some debts, you see, my board and my tailor's bill. They got out some sort of paper after me. Yes, I had forgotten about my bonds. I lost every damned one of them playing cards, gambled them all away. Ain't I no good? But I was winner once. Just in two nights I won ten thousand dollars. Then I must have lost it again. You see, I get so hungry sometimes that I twitch all over. So, just like that. Lend me a dollar. For a few moments Geary was silent, watching Vandover curiously, as he sat in a heap on the edge of the chair, fumbling his greenish hat, looking about the floor. Presently he asked, When did you lose your job at the paint shop? Day before yesterday. "'And you are out of work now?' "'Yes,' answered Vandover. "'I'm broke. I haven't a cent. "'I'm blessed if I know how I'm to get along. "'Lately I've been working for a paint shop, "'painting landscapes on safes. "'I drew down fifty dollars a week there, "'but I've lost my job.' "'Good Lord, Van,' Geary suddenly exclaimed, "'nodding his head toward him reflectively. "'I'm sorry for you.' "'The other laughed. "'Yes, I suppose I'm a pitiable-looking object, "'but I'm used to it.' I don't mind much now, as long as I can have a place to sleep and enough to eat. If you can put me in the way of some work, Charlie, I'd be much obliged. You see, that's what I want. Work. I don't want to run any bunco game. I'm an honest man. I'm too honest. I gave away all my money to help another poor duck. Gave him thousands. He was good to me when I was on my uppers, and I meant to repay him. I was grateful. I signed a paper that gave him everything I had. It was in Paris. That's where my bonds went to. He was a struggling artist. "'Look here,' said Geary, willing to be interested. "'You might as well be truthful with me. "'You can't lie to me. "'Have you gambled away all those bonds, "'or have you been victimized, "'or have you still got them? "'Come now, spit it out.' "'Charlie, I haven't a cent,' answered Vanover, "'looking him squarely in the face. "'Would I be around here trying to get work from you if I had? "'No, I gambled it all away. "'You know I had 8,900 in U.S. 4 per cents. "'Well, first I began to pawn things when my money got short. "'The old gentleman's watch that I said I never would part with. "'Then my clothes. "'I couldn't keep away from the cards. "'Of course you can't understand that. "'Gambling was the only thing that could amuse me. "'Then I began to mortgage my bonds, very little at first. "'Oh, I went slow. "'Then I got to selling them. "'Well, somehow they all went. "'For a time I got along by the work at the paint shop. "'But they have let me out now, said I was so irregular.' I owe for nearly a month at my lodging place. His eyes sought the floor again, rolling about stupidly. Nearly a month, and that's what makes me jump and tremble so. You ought to see me sometimes. Brrr, and I get to barking. I'm a wolf, mostly, you know, or some kind of animal, some kind of brute. But I'd be all right if everything didn't go round very slowly and seem far off. But I'm a wolf. You look out for me. Best take care I don't bite you. Wolf! wolf ah it's up four flights at the end of the hall very dark eight thousand dollars in a green cloth sack and lots of lights of burnin see how long my fingernails are regular claws that's the wolf the brute why can't i talk in my mouth instead of in my throat that's the devil of it when you paint on steel and iron your colors don't dry out true all the yellows turn green but it would have been all straight if they hadn't fired me i never talked to anybody that was my business wasn't it and when all those eight thousand little lights began to burn red, why, of course, that makes you nervous. So I have to drink a great deal of water and chew butcher's paper. That fools him and he thinks he's eating, just so as I can lay quiet in the plaza when the sun is out. There's a hack stand there, you know, and every time that horse tosses his head so as to get the oats in the bottom of the nose bag, he jingles the chains on the poles, and by God, that's funny, makes me laugh every time. 
sounds gay and the chain sparkles mighty pretty oh i don't complain give me a dollar and i'll bark for you geary leaned back in his chair listening to vandover struck with wonder marvelling at that which his old chum had come to be he was sorry for him too yet nevertheless he felt a certain indefinite satisfaction a faint exultation over his misfortunes glad that their positions were not reversed pleased that he had been clever enough to keep free from those habits those modes of life that ended in such fashion he rapped sharply on the table vandover straightened up raising his eyes you want some work he demanded yes that's what i'm after answered vandover adding i must have it well said geary hesitatingly i can give you something to do but it'll be pretty dirty vandover smiled a little saying i guess you can't give me any work that would be too dirty for me with the words he suddenly began to cry again i want to be honest mr geary he exclaimed drawing the backs of his fingers across his lips i want to be honest i'm down and i don't mean no offence charlie you and i were old chums once at harvard my god to think i was a harvard man once oh i'm a goner now and i ain't got a friend when i was in the paint shop they paid me well i've been in a paint shop lately painting the little pictures on the safes little landscapes you know and lakes with mountains around them i pulled down my twenty dollars in findings oh don't be a fool cried gary ashamed even to see such an exhibition if you can't be a man you can get out now see here you came up here once and insulted me in my office and called me a swindler ah you bet you had the swelled head then and insulted me attacked my honesty and charged me with shoving the queer now i never forget those things generally but i am willing to let that pass this time i could be nasty now and tell you to rustle for yourself if you want half a dollar now to get something to eat while well, i'll give it to you but i don't propose to support you ah no i guess not if you want to work i'll give you a chance but i shall expect you to do good work if i give you my good money for it you may be drunk now or i don't know what's the matter with you but you come up here to-morrow at noon and if you come up here sober or straight or geary began to make awkward gestures in the air with both hands come up here to talk business i might have something for you but i can't stop any longer this evening vandover got upon his feet slowly turning his greenish hat about by the brim nodding his head all right all right he answered thank you very much mr geary it's very good of you i'm sure i'll be around at noon sure when geary was left alone he walked slowly to his window and stood there a moment looking aimlessly down into the street shaking his head repeatedly astonished at the degradation of his old-time chum while he stood there he saw vandover come out upon the sidewalk from the door of the great office building geary watched him very interested vandover paused a moment upon the sidewalk turning up the collar of his old cutaway coat against the cold tray wind that was tearing through the streets he thrust both his hands deep into his trousers pockets gripping his sides with his elbows and drawing his shoulders together shrinking into a small compass in order to be warm the wind blew the tails of his cutaway about him like flapping wings he went up the street walking fast keeping to the outside of the sidewalk his shoulders bent his head inclined against the wind his feet dragging after him as he walked for a moment geary lost sight of him amid a group of men who were hoisting a piano upon a dray the street was rather crowded with office boys clerks and typewriters going home to supper and geary did not catch sight of him again immediately then all at once he saw him hesitating on a corner of kearney street waiting for an electric car to pass he crossed the street running his hands still in his pockets and went on hurriedly dodging in and out of the throng his high shoulders long neck and greenish hat coming into sight at intervals for a moment he paused to glance into the show window of a tobacconist and pipe seller's store a chinese woman passed him pattering along lamely her green jade earrings twinkling in the light of a street lamp newly lighted vandover looked after her a moment gazing stupidly then suddenly took up his walk again zigzagging amid the groups on the asphalt striding along at a great pace his head low and swinging from side to side as he walked he was already far down the street it was dusk geary could only catch glimpses of his head and shoulders at long intervals he disappeared end of chapter eighteen part one Chapter 18, Part 2 of Vandover and the Brute. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Vandover and the Brute by Frank Norris. Chapter 18, Part 2. 
about ten minutes before one the next day as geary came back from lunch he was surprised to see vandover peeping through the half-open door of his office he had not thought that vandover would come back of the many different stories that vandover had told about the disappearance of his bonds the one that was probably truest was the one that accounted for the thing by his passion for gambling for a long time after his advent at the reno house this passion had been dormant he knew no one with whom he could play and every cent of his income now went for food and lodging but one day about six months before his visit to geary's office vandover saw that the proprietor of the reno house had set up a great bagatelle board in a corner of the reading room a group of men sailors ranchmen and fruit vendors were already playing vandover approached and watched the game very interested in watching the uncertain course of the marble jog jogging among the pins the clear little note of the bell or the dry rattle as the marble settled quickly into one of the lucky pockets thrilled him from head to foot his hands trembled all at once his whole left side twitched sharply from that day the fate of the rest of vandover's little money was decided in two weeks he had lost twenty dollars at bagatelle obtaining the money by selling a portion of his bonds at a certain broker's on montgomery street as soon as he had begun to gamble again the old habits of extravagance had come back upon him from the moment he knew that he could get all the money he wanted by the mere signing of a paper he ceased to be economical scorning the former niggardliness that had led him to starve on one day that he might feast the next now he feasted every day he still kept his room at the reno house but instead of taking his meals by any ticket system he began to affect the restaurants of the spanish quarter gorging himself with the hot spiced meals three and four times a day he quickly abandoned the bagatelle board for the card table gambling furiously with two of the ranchmen almost invariably vandover lost and the more he lost the more eager and reckless he became in a little time he had sold every one of his bonds and had gambled away all but twenty dollars of the money received from the last one sold this sum this twenty dollars vandover decided to husband carefully it was all that was left between him and starvation he made up his mind that he must stop gambling and find something to do he had long since abandoned his work at the paint shop but at this time he returned there and asked for his old occupation they laughed in his face was that the way he thought they did business not much another man had his job a much better man and one who was regular who could be depended on that same evening vandover broke his twenty dollars and became very drunk a game of poker was started in a back room of one of the saloons on the barbary coast one of the players was a rancher named tote a fellow boarder at the reno house but the two other players were strangers and there in that narrow dirty room sawdust on the floor festoons of fly specked red and blue tissue paper adorning the single swinging lamp figures cut from bill posters of the black crook pasted on the walls there in the still hours after midnight long after the bar room outside had been closed for the night the last penny of vandover's estate was gambled away the game ended in a quarrel vandover very drunk and exasperated at his ill luck accusing his friend tote the rancher of cheating tote kicked him in the stomach and made him abominably sick then they went away and left vandover alone in the little dirty room racked with nausea very drunk fallen forward upon the table and crying into his folded arms after a little he went to sleep but the nausea continued nevertheless and in a few moments he gagged and vomited he never moved he was too drunk to wake his hands and his coat sleeves the table all about him were foul beyond words but he slept on in the midst of it all inert stupefied a great swarm of flies buzzing about his head and face it was the day after this that he had come to see geary ah said geary as he came up it's you is it well i didn't expect to see you again sit down outside there in the hall and wait a few minutes i'm not ready to go yet or wait here i tell you what to do geary wrote off a list of articles on a slip of paper and pushed it across the table toward vandover together with a little money you get those at the nearest grocery and by the time you are back i'll be ready to go that day geary took vandover out to the mission they went out in the cable car geary sitting inside reading the morning's paper vandover standing on the front platform carrying the things that geary had told him to buy a bar of soap a scrubbing brush some wiping cloths a broom and a pail almost at the end of the car line they got off and crossed over to where geary's property stood 
Vandover looked about him. The ground on which his own block had once stood was now occupied by an immense red brick building with white stone trimmings. In front on either side of the main entrance were white stone medallions upon which were chiseled the head of a workman wearing the square paper cap that the workman never wears, and a bent-up forearm, the biceps enormous, the fist gripping the short hammer that the workman never uses. An enormous round chimney sprouted from one corner. Through the open windows came the vast purring of machinery it was a boot and shoe factory built by the great concern who had bought the piece of property from geary for fifteen thousand dollars the same property geary had bought from vandover for eight across the street from the factory was a long row of little cottages very neat each having a tiny garden in front where nasturtiums grew there were fifteen of these cottages three of them only were vacant that was my idea observed geary as they approached the row willing to explain even though he thought vandover would not comprehend and it pays like a nitrate bed i was clever enough to see that cottages like these were just what's wanted by the workmen in the factory that have families i made some money when i sold out my block to the boot and shoe people and i invested it again in these cottages they are cheap and serviceable and they meet the demand vandover nodded his head in assent looking vaguely about him now at the cottages now at the great building across the street geary got the keys to one of the vacant cottages and the two went inside now here's what i want you to do began geary pointing about with his stick you see when some of these people go out they leave the rooms nasty and that tells against the house when parties come to look at it i want you to go all over it top and bottom end to end and give it a good cleaning sweep the floor and wash the paint you know and now these windows you see how dirty they are wash those inside and out but don't disturb the agent's signs you understand yes i understand now come out here into the kitchen look at these laundry tubs and that sink see all the grease clean that all out and underneath the sink here see that rubbish take that out too now in here look at the bathtub and toilet you see how nasty they have left them you want to make them look like new yes now come downstairs you see i give them a little floored basement here kind of a storeroom and coal room here's where most of the dirt and rubbish is just look at it see all that pile over there i see take it all out and pile it in the back yard i'll have an ash man come and remove it whew there is a dead hen under here sling that out the first thing they went back through the house again and geary pointed out the tiny garden to vandover straighten that up a bit pick up those old newspapers and the tin cans make it look neat now you understand just what i want you make a good job of it and when you are through with this house you begin on the next vacant one further down the row you can get the keys at the same place you get to work right away I should think you ought to finish this house this afternoon. All right, answered Vandover. I'm going to look around a little. I'll drop in again in about an hour and see how you're getting on. With that, Geary went away. It was Saturday afternoon, and as the law office closed at noon that day, Geary very often spent the time until evening looking about his property. He left Vandover and went slowly down the street, noting each particular house with immense satisfaction, even entering some of them, talking with the women folk, all the men being at the factory. Vandover took off his coat, his old and greasy cutaway, and began work. He drew a pail of water from the garden faucet in a neighbor's yard and commenced washing the windows. First he washed the panes from the inside, very careful not to disturb Adams and Brunt's signs, and then cleaned the outside, sitting upon the window ledge, his body half in and half out of the house. Geary enjoyed himself immensely. The news of the landlord's visit had spread from cottage to cottage, awakening a mild excitement throughout the length of the row the women showed themselves on the steps or on the sidewalks very slatternly without corsets their hair coming down dressed in faded calico wrappers just as they had come from the laundry tubs or the cook stove they bethought them of their various grievances a leak here a broken doorbell there a certain bad smell that was supposed to have some connection with a rash upon the children's faces they waited for geary's appearance by ones and twos timid very respectful but querulous for all that filling the air with their lamentations Vandover had finished with the windows. Now he was cleaning out the sink and the laundry tubs. They smelt very badly and were all foul with a greasy mixture of old lard, soap, soot, and dust. A little mold was even beginning to form about the faucets of the tubs. The escape pipe of the sink was clogged, and he had to run his finger into it again and again to get it free. The kitchen was very dirty. Old bottles of sweet oil, moldy vinegar, and flat beer cluttered the dusty shelves of the pantry meanwhile geary continued his rounds he went about among the groups of his tenants very pleased and contented smiling affably upon them he enlarged himself giving himself the airs of an english lord in the midst of his tenantry listening to their complaints with a good-humoured smile of toleration a few men were about some of whom were out of work for the moment others who were sick 
to these geary was particularly condescending he sat in their parlors little crowded rooms smelling of stale upholstery and of the last meal where knitted worsted tidies very gaudy covered the backs of the larger chairs and where one inevitably discovered the what-not standing in one corner its shelves filled with shell boxes broken thermometers and little alabaster jars shaped like funeral urns where one kept the matches the wife brought the children in very dirty looking solemnly at geary their eyes enlarged in the direct unwinking gaze of cows by this time vandover had finished with the sinks and the tubs and was down upon his hands and knees scrubbing the stains of grease upon the floor of the kitchen it was very hard work as his water was cold he was still working about this spot when geary returned by this time vandover was so tired that he trembled all over his spine seemed to be breaking in two and every now and then he paused and passed his hand over the small of his back closing his eyes and drawing a long breath well how are you getting on asked geary as he came into the kitchen drawing on his gloves about ready to go home oh i'm getting along replied vandover rising up to his knees you want to hurry up answered geary you must be done with this house by this evening you see i want to advertise it in tomorrow's papers all right i'll have it done pretty dirty wasn't it yes pretty dirty you may have to work here a little later than usual this afternoon but be sure you have everything cleaned up before you leave geary said all right answered vandover bending to his work again just as geary was leaving he had the admirable good fortune to meet on the steps of the cottage a little group who were house hunting two young women and a little boy the mother of the little boy so she explained to him was married to one of the burnishers in the factory the other woman was her sister geary showed them about the little house very eager to secure them as tenants then and there he began to sing its praises its nearness to the factory its excellent plumbing its bathroom and its one stationary washstand its little garden and its location on the sunny side of the street i'm a good landlord he said to them as he ushered them into the kitchen any one in the row will tell you that i make it a point to keep my houses in good repair and to keep them clean you see i have a man here now cleaning out vandover glanced up at the woman an instant the two of them and the little boy looked down at him on all fours upon the floor then he went on with his work this is the kitchen you see pursued geary notice how large it is you see here are your laundry tubs your iron sink your boiler everything you need of course it's a little grimy now but by the time the man gets through it will be as clean as your face now come downstairs here and i'll show the basement in a moment their voices sounded through the floor of the kitchen an indistinct continuous murmur then the party returned and passed by vandover again and stood for a long time in the front room haggling the cottage rented for fifteen dollars the young woman was willing to take it at that but with the understanding that geary should pay the water rent geary refused unwilling to even listen to such a thing every other tenant in the row paid for his own water the young woman went away shaking their heads sadly geary let them get halfway down the front steps and then called them back he offered a compromise the young women should pay for the water but half their first month's rent should be remitted the burnisher's wife still hesitated saying you know yourself this house is awfully dirty well you see i'm having it cleaned it'll have to be cleaned pretty thoroughly i can't stand dirt it will be cleaned thoroughly persisted geary the man will work at it until it is you can keep an eye on him and see that the work is done to suit you you see objected the burnisher's wife i would want to move in right away i don't want to wait all week for the man to get through but he is going to be through with this house tonight exclaimed geary delighted come now i know you want this cottage and i would like to have such nice-looking people have it i know you would make good tenants i can find lots of other tenants for this house only you know how it is a nasty slovenly woman about the house and a raft of dirty children and you don't like dirt i can see that better call it a bargain and let it go at that in the end the burnisher's wife took the house geary even induced her to deposit five dollars with him in order to secure it vandover was down in the basement filling a barrel with the odds and ends of rubbish left by the previous tenants broken bottles old corsets bones rusty bed springs the dead hen he had taken out first of all carrying it by one leg it was a gruesome horror partly eaten by rats swollen abnormally heavy one side flattened from lying so long upon the floor he could hardly stand each time he bent over it seemed as though his backbone was disjointing after cleaning out the debris he began to sweep the dust was fearful choking blinding so thick that he could hardly see what he was about by and by he dimly made out geary's figure in the doorway those people have taken the house he called out and i promised them you would be through with it by this evening so you want to stay with it now till you're finished i guess there's not much more to do don't forget the little garden in the front no i won't forget 
geary went away and for another hour vandover kept at his work stolidly his mind empty of all thought knowing only that he was very tired that his back pained him he finished with the basement but as he was pottering about the little garden picking up the discolored newspapers with which it was littered the burnisher's wife returned together with her sister and the little boy the little boy eating a slice of bread and butter they re-entered the house vandover heard their voices now in one room now in another they were looking over their future home again evidently they lived close by suddenly the burnisher's wife came out upon the front steps looking down into the little garden calling for vandover she was not pretty she had a nose like a man and her chin was broad say there she called to vandover do you mean to say that you've finished inside here yes answered vandover straightening up nodding his head yes i finished well just come in here and look at this vandover followed her into the little parlor her sister was there very fat smelling somehow of tallow candles and cooked cabbage nearby stood the little boy still eating his bread and butter look at that baseboard exclaimed the burnisher's wife you never touch that i'll bet a hat vandover did not answer he brought in the pail of water soaping his scrubbing brush went down again on his hands and knees washing the paint on the baseboard where the burnisher's wife indicated the two women stood by looking on and directing his movements the little boy watched everything never speaking a word slowly eating his bread and butter streaks of butter and bread clung to his cheeks stretching from the corners of his mouth to his ears i don't see how you come to overlook that said the burnisher's wife to vandover that's the dirtiest baseboard i ever saw oh my i just can't naturally stand dirt there you didn't get that stain off that's tobacco juice i guess go back and wash that over again vandover obeyed holding the brush in one hand crawling back along the floor upon one palm and his two knees a pool of soapy dirty water very cold gathered about him soaking in through the old blue pants and wetting him to the skin but he slovened through it indifferently put a little more elbow grease to it continued the burnisher's wife you have to rub them spots pretty hard to get em out now scrub all along here near the floor you see that streak there that's all gormed up with something or other bugs get in there mighty quick there that'll do i guess now is everything else all clean mr geary said it was to be done to my satisfaction and that you were to stay here until everything was all right all at once her voice was interrupted by the prolonged roar of the factory's whistle blowing as though it would never stop it was half past five in an instant the faint purring of the machinery dwindled and ceased leaving an abrupt silence in the air a moment later the army of operatives began to pour out of the main entrance men and girls and young boys all in a great hurry the men settling their coat collars as they ran down the steps the usually quiet street was crowded in an instant the burnisher's wife stood on the steps of the vacant house with her sister watching the throng debauch into the street all at once the sister exclaimed there he is and the other began to call oscar oscar waving her hand to one of the workmen on the other side of the street it was her husband the burnisher and he came across the street crowding his lunch basket into the pocket of his coat he was a thin little man with a timid air his face white and fat and covered with a sparse unshaven stubble of a pale straw color an odor as of a harness shop hung about him vandover gathered up his broom and pail and soap preparing to go home well oscar i've taken the house said his wife to the burnisher as he came up the steps but i couldn't get him to say he'd let me have it for fifteen water included the landlord himself mr geary was here today and i made the dicker with him he's had a man here all day cleaning up she explained the bargain the burnisher approving of everything nodding his head continually his wife showed him about the house her sister and the little boy following in silence he's a good landlord i guess continued the young woman anybody in the row will tell you that and he means to keep his houses in good repair now you see here's the kitchen you see how big it is here's our laundry tubs our iron sink our boiler and everything we want it's all as clean as a whistle and get on to this big cubby under the sink where i can stow away things she opened its door to show her husband but all at once straightened up exclaiming well dear me suze did you ever see anything like that the cubby under the sink was abominably dirty vandover had altogether forgotten it the little burnisher himself bent down and peered in oh that'll never do he cried has that man gone home yet he mustn't he's got to clean this out first he had a weak faint voice small and timid like his figure he hurried out to the front door and called vandover back just as he was going down the steps the two went back into the kitchen and stood in front of the sink look under there piped the burnisher you can't leave that that way you know protested his wife that this all was to be done to our satisfaction mr geary said so that's the only way i came to take the house it's about six o'clock though observed her fat sister who smelt of cooked cabbage perhaps he'd want to go home to his dinner 
but at this both the others cried out in one voice the burnisher exclaiming i can't help that this has got to be done first while his wife protested that she couldn't naturally stand dirt adding this was all to be done to our satisfaction and we ain't satisfied yet by a long shot delighted at this excitement the little boy forgot to eat into his bread and butter rolling his eyes wildly from one to the other still silent meanwhile without replying vandover had gone down upon the floor again poking about amid the filth under the sink the four others the burnisher his wife his sister-in-law and his little boy stood about in a half circle behind him seeing to it that he did the work properly giving orders as to how he should proceed now be sure you get everything out that's under there said the burnisher oof how it smells they made a regular dump heap of it what's that over in the corner there cried the wife bending down i can't see it so dark under there something gray can't you see in under there you'll have to crawl way in to get at it go way in vandover obeyed the sink pipes were so close above him that he was obliged to crouch lower and lower at length he lay flat upon his stomach prone in the filth under the sink in the sour water the grease the refuse he groped about with his hand searching for the something gray that the burnisher's wife had seen he found it and drew it out it was an old ham bone covered with a greenish fuzz oh did you ever cried the burnisher holding up his hands here don't drop that on my clean floor put it in your pail now get out the rest of the dirt and hurry up it's late vandover crawled back half the way under the sink again this time bringing out a rusty pan half full of some kind of congealed gravy that exhaled a choking acrid odor next it was an old stocking then an ink bottle a broken rat trap a battered teapot lacking a nozzle a piece of rubber hose an old comb choked with a great handful of hair a torn overshoe newspapers and a great quantity of other debris that had accumulated there during the occupancy of the previous tenant now go over the floor with a rag ordered the little burnisher when the last of these articles had been brought out wipe up all that nasty muck look there by your knee to your left scrub that big spot there with your brush looks like grease that's the style scrub it hard his wife joined her directions to his then it was over here and over there now in that corner now in this and now with his brush and soap and now with his dry rag and hurry up all the time because it was growing late but the little boy carried away by the interest of the occasion suddenly broke silence for the first time crying out shrilly his mouth full of bread and butter hey there get up you old lazy bones the others shouted with laughter there was a smart little boy for you ah he'd be a man before his mother it was wonderful how that boy saw everything that went on he took an interest that was it you ought to see he watched everything and sometimes he'd plump out with things that were astonishing for a boy of his years only four and a half too and they reminded each other of the first day he put on knickerbockers stood in the front of the house on the sidewalk all day long with his hands in his pockets the interest was directed from vandover they turned their backs grouping themselves about the little boy the burnisher's sister-in-law felt called upon to tell about her little girl a matter of family pride she was going on twelve and would you suppose that little thing was in the next to last grade in the grammar school her teacher had said that she was a real wonder never had had such a bright pupil ah but one should see how she studied over her books all the time next year they were to try to get her into the high school of course she was not ready for the high school yet and it was against the rule to let children in that way she was too young but they had a pull you understand oh yes for sure they had a pull they'd work her in all right the burnisher's wife was not listening she wanted to draw the interest back to her own little boy she bent down and straightened out his little jacket saying does he like his bread and butter well he could have all he wanted but the little boy paid no attention to her he had made a bon mot ambition stirred in him he had tasted the delights of an appreciative audience bread and butter had fallen in his esteem he wished to repeat his former success and cried out shriller than ever hey there get up you old lazy bones but his father corrected him his mother ought not to encourage him to be rude that's not right oscar he observed shaking his head you must be kind to the poor man vandover was sitting back on his heels to rest his back waiting till the others should finish well all through inquired the burnisher in his thin voice vandover nodded but his wife was not satisfied until she had herself carefully peered into the cubby while her husband held a lighted match for her ah that's something like she said finally it was nearly seven vandover prepared to go home a second time the little boy stood in front of him looking down at him as he made his brush and rags and broom into a bundle the boy slowly eating his bread and butter the while in one corner of the room an excited whispered conference was going on between the burnisher his wife and his fat sister-in-law from time to time one heard such expressions as overtime you know not afraid of work ah think i'd better looks as though he needed it in a moment the two women went out calling in vain for the little boy to follow and the burnisher crossed the room toward vandover vandover was on his knees tying up his bundle with a bit of bale rope 
i'm sorry began the burnisher awkwardly we didn't mean to keep you from your supper here he went on holding out a quarter to vandover here you take this that's all right you worked overtime for us that's all right come along oscar come along my son vandover put the quarter in his vest pocket thank you sir he said the burnisher hurried away calling back come along my son don't keep your mamma waiting for supper but the little boy remained very interested in watching vandover still on the floor tying the last knots as he finished he glanced up for an instant the two remained there motionless looking into each other's eyes vandover on the floor one hand twisted into the bale rope about his bundle the little boy standing before him eating the last mouthful of his bread and butter end of chapter eighteen part two end of vandover and the brute by frank norris